Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through. right here on another day. You will hear noise in the background. Oh, God damn it. However, it is from AEW, and once again, it is self-induced, but we'll be talking about, I guess, AEW versus NXT, and who knows what else. I'm in a good mood today. I'm your host, the great Brian Lass, <laughs> yeah. and here he is, Mr. Bad Mood himself, Jim Cornette. No, come on. I'm positively giddy, Brian, compared to you. I am slapsticky. I am just jubilant. Jubilation T corn pone is who you can call me today because I'm just, I'm up and over the moon about these things. And while you, Brian, you, you have been having a very shitty day. Did you, did, did you ever wake up, ladies and gentlemen, early one morning and find that? Shortly after you started your day, life just shit on you, just shit right in your lap, and and all you could do with that shit in your lap was try to take something and wipe it off, but it just smears it and makes an even bigger brown stain. And it's the first thing in the morning, you can't go anywhere like that. People be saying, look at that guy with the shit all over him. Life has done shit in his lap. So instead, you... You have to slink back home. You have to take off your clothes. You have to shower the shit of life off of you. And then you got to crawl back into your bed and just say, fuck it for today, folks. But sometimes we persevere. But Brian, you've been having a shitty day. Yeah, you know, you're a fucking dick. So <laughs> because there are enough elements of what you just said that are kind of true, I guess I'll just say it. I had a bunch of things going on today, including taking Swami to the groomer, and Swami doesn't like leaving the house and going to the groomer, and he had some kind of fucking reaction right when we got there, and he shit on my lap, and I had this dirty towel in the car. I had to get out of the car. I was there. I wasn't coming home. I had to find a way to get inside, and I couldn't walk inside, obviously, with no pants or no shirt. So I wiped. It was mostly, like, on my lap area. On the right side. <laughs> the lapple area. And it was more diarrhea-ish than, like, it wasn't like a hard shit. You could just, like, you know, brush off or something. What a reaction, by the way, from, should Swami be going to the groomer or the vet? Yeah, well, that's, Ex a, that's the next Explosive projectile diarrhea just for going to the groomer. What are the groomers grooming on him? What are they doing to this poor dog? So I, I got Swami in there. I made sure the guy there knew there was no small talk happening today. Just take my dog, call me in an hour. <laughs> I and a half don't or think he minded. You smelled like shit. You know, he was looking in my eyes. Like he's like one of those people who looks in your eyes. So I don't know if he saw my shit pants. <laughs> so now I had to get home and the towel. I, I'm going to admit this and I apologize to a local law enforcement. I littered. I just left that fucking towel of shit on the ground. I was not putting that back in my fucking car. Oh, come on now. I, I don't care. I don't care who's bothered by that. I don't give a shit. Be injured. I literally a, don't give a shit. I a left child could, could have wandered by and picked that up and taken it home and infected the whole family. If there's a child walking around the middle of the parking lot picking up dirty towels... I think their problems are much bigger than well, uh, the Swami shit-filled No, civic-minded youngsters. Start them early. Get them out there, four or five years old. Have them policing the areas. We're picking up on the side of the interstate. Why do the poor prisoners have to do all the work? Your comprehension, the kids have got nothing else to do. Your comprehension of what children should do or what they do do is astounding at all times. But speaking of doo-doo... <laughs> said doo-doo. Well, speaking of doo-doo, I had to get home, and I got home, and I took off my clothes, and Suzanne helped me, you know, function... Because I was having a little bit of a meltdown. I was pissed off. I had to cancel my appointment that I had after were, that. No, you weren't pissed off. You were shit on. I was shit on, and then I called up my appointment, and I didn't want to lie, but I also didn't want to say my dog just shit all over my pants, and some of it got on my shirt, and I got to clean my car. So I just well, said I had car. So I said I had go car problems. The governor would have understood. I said I had car problems. <laughs> But then it wasn't over. And then I said, hey, Jim, let me tell you what happened. I don't want to talk about this on the air. And then well, that's why I did. I, you have freely oh. admitted all this information. I was just, I was going to talk about your rotten internet service. I wasn't saying a word about Swami Two could play and his this game. bowel malfunctions. Hey, two could play this game. Brian, help me out. I need to get bailed out. This donkey and me got caught in a field. Oh, no. Hey, what come on. Do? It, and it wasn't a field. It was the back of a shopping center, I'll have you know. But otherwise than that, we, we, we won't discuss it. 
But what, see, but then as soon as you go back to business, after you get finished with the veterinary part of your day, you get on your, you remember your blazing fast internet you used to have, nanny nanny boo boo. Well, now poo -poo. You, you're poo poo or boo boo, either one, or honey boo boo for that matter. Did you ever see Mama June's bare feet? <laughs> no, you know, I'm aware who of. Uh, uh, hua. I'm aware of hua. <laughs> I'm aware of hua. <laughs> honey a boo boo is. <laughs> I know who Honey Boo Boo is and loosely who her mom is, but I, I don't know anything about in the first their season, feet, let alone their show. Out of morbid curiosity, we watched like three or four shows in the first season, and just to see these grotesque, fucking pygmy and troll people and the various human oddities that uh, occupy their fucking orbit. And on one of the episodes, old Mama June, this before she had all the fat suction and liposuction and plastic surgery, they had enough left over to make a midget when they gave her her facelift. And her tummy tuck is actually debuting in NXT next month. But anyway, so at one point she took her shoes off and she not only had some kind of goddamn fungus going on around the nail of her big toe, but there were actually either gnats or fleas or microscopic little flies buzzing about it. And somebody told her, you ought to get that looked at. Yeah, by the exterminator. But where were we? Is he, is he working in NXT too now, the exterminator? Where were we going? Oh, you're blazing fast internet. We get on here trying to do this fine program. And at internet, you brag about some goddamn lightning quick boom. You can flip the switch and be in the bed before the room goes dark type of quick. And... Sound like that, and you do your speed test. I'm going to reveal your speed. This is where I was going. You just told you, you divined yourself there. Your speed was 255. Are you taking notes when you talk to me? Yes, I wrote it down because I wanted I wanted to make sure I was precise that you admitted to a speed. Is it now? Is it the 255 migs that go up to the gig, or does the gigs go up to the mig? Well, now it's 539. Well, now you. Oh no, five ninety three. Excuse me, five ninety three oh, oh. point nine. Oh, well, yeah, it's easy to. That's only a difference of fifty something fucking points. Five ninety three point nine. I reversed the three and the nine. I became dyslexic oh, yeah. for a moment. I can see a lot of things reverted. <laughs> Here you go. No, I'm kidding. But you, your blazing fast was almost down to the goddamn level of my shitty spectrum with your infinity folks up there that came and were digging around in people's yards and cut you off for a while, and you haven't been right since. Xfinity. You know, Spectrum has a catchy commercial. They got, like, these rappers in, like, a driveway. I don't know what's going on. Oh, I'd like to drive down that driveway about 60 miles an hour, that song, and it goes on and on. And <laughs> what so you've the heard it. You heard oh, it. <laughs> yeah, it plays here all the time. They'd spend that money on quality service instead of fucking abrasive goddamn music. We wouldn't be in this predicament. I was I was busy yesterday. I was trying to get my corbels. What? I was trying to get my corbels because we have a need for corbels over here at the castle. And we didn't like any of the store-bought corbels that were available. So we're having our corbels custom made by the, the folks that make the corbels over at, at Bluegrass Ironworks. Congratulations. Have you ever had a problem finding the right corbels and need to have custom-made corbels, or do you just pick up any old corbels that they have over at Home Depot? Uh, I've never had to buy a corbel most places, uh, I guess. Well, you don't buy a corbel. you got to have two of them, or elsewise you've just shit the bed. It's like having one midget on a car. Well, it depends on the item you're talking about and where it is in the room. Not necessarily. One could sometimes be sufficient. Wait a minute. What the? F where are you going to put a corbel inside the fucking house? I don't know. Well, you can obviously tell the listeners exactly what a corbel is, can't you? It's like a stand for under... Not a stand, but it's like a... <laughs> a base for shelves. I don't know what the... F no, I'm talking about a corbel. Right? Not a little shelf support, but a corbel. See, when we had the remodel done... We had an area over the back door, a little gable, a little overhang put put over the top of it. A little gable. So, a little gable, not not shorty gable, but a, one of his cousins. 
but a little overhang there, a little roof area, so the covering, so if we let Harley out in a sprinkle, she'll go out in a sprinkle. The heavy deluge, she's like, fuck you. But if we let her out in a sprinkle, we can stand there and keep eye on her while she's doing her business without standing in the rain. Because then we'd just be standing in the rain. And so we needed corbels, which are the supports which go on either side of the goddamn deal. He goes up the wall and out on the thing. Exactly what I said. You were talking about shelves in your office. I'm talking about the corbels. I'm talking about the corbels. And I was explaining the corbels. And I was explaining a minimalist look. Well, I was talking about Cornette's corbels. (laughs) And that's and that's what I need. And these things are are gonna be big and ornamental iron and etc. And 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 serve as as support, not not only support, but also decoration. There's gonna be a fleur de lis incorporated in there in some fashion and well, it'll just be swell. Corbels, ladies and gentlemen, is the word of the day. All right. Well, we've this is of, your program. Far have, be it for me to just take over. We have lots of kernels of wrestling to uh, talk did, about. Did I, did I mention the sale going on now at jimcornette.com is in full swing? I don't want to be negligent here on the program. Don't want to do an unprofessional job. The, all the merchandise is back on sale at jimcornette.com. After the Midnight Express four-pack action figure 40th anniversary set pre-order period, which now, I'll have you know, the feather bottoms have packed and mailed nearly 400 of those fine pieces of merchandise and more coming soon. And they're exceeding the guidelines that we had set out. People are going to have this stuff for Thanksgiving at this rate. But now you can get everything, T-shirts to wear, DVDs to watch, books to read, Action figures to action and and fondle and covet and keep and all the variety of things on sale at jimcornette.com. Right before the holidays, fill out your Christmas list in one place, get it over with, move on to more important things, and figure out how you're going to make back all the money you spent. Jimcornette.com. But that's just a reminder, Brian. All right. Well, there's the reminder. And this is the uh, shitty pants edition of <laughs> the drive through because it goes downhill from here. Did you see the big news? This seems like it's right down your alley, Jim. The NWA announced the return of the territory system. Oh, boy, I can't wait. I have a press release here. National Wrestling Alliance embarks on historic territory system revival under leadership of President William Patrick Corgan. The first affiliate territory for the Lightning One era is NWA Exodus Pro Wrestling, not Pro Wrestling, excuse me, Exodus Pro Midwest territory. Well, that just rolls right off the tongue. I screwed it up, so let me do it justice. The first affiliate territory for the Lightning One era is NWA Exodus Pro Midwest. That, again, just rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it, Brian? The territory is... (laughs) NWA Exodus Pro Midwest. Territory is led by NWA World Heavyweight Champion EC3. Wouldn't you know who won the pony? Or the Exodus. More territories are being explored domestically and internationally. So there's room for more. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, you think they got room for a couple more? I don't know. They're, they're going to be awful busy. Cleveland, Ohio. In a move marking a pivotal moment in the history of the National Wrestling Alliance, the NWA, President William Patrick Corgan has announced the revival of the promotion's territory system, a cherished tradition for the NWA, which helped them cheat wrestlers out of money and hide money from the government. Oh, excuse me. That was a different draft here which harkens back to the roots of professional wrestling. That was redacted. And the Alliance's formation 75 years ago. The move is aimed at fostering collaboration, unity, and the development of future wrestling stars. The inaugural affiliate territory to join this initiative is NWA Exodus Pro Midwest. (laughs) See, now I can't even say it without (laughs) smiling because of you. Under the stewardship 
of none. See, I, I put smiles on people's faces. Under the stewardship of none other than the NWA World's Heavyweight Champion, EC3. Let me stop there for a moment. What are your initial thoughts on, I guess, the, uh, the moxie? I don't know what you want to say. What are your initial thoughts on the idea, the concept, and uh, anything else here? Well, I mean, I'm obviously all in favor of the territory concept. Uh, that's what I've been saying for many, many years now. The problem is this ain't it. And I'm not knocking EC3. I'm not even talking about a personal attack on the current reigning and defending NWA world champion. There are no territories, Jerry. There are no territories. You, you can say you're going to revive the territory system. And by the way, the first one is... An independent promotion, obviously owned and or operated by our world champion. What kind of schedule is he running? And where are the other territories that are going to join this thing over the next five years? Where are the territories, Jerry? It, it, even, what was it, 25 of 30 years ago now when Dennis Corluzzo and Howard Brody were trying to put together an NWA of different promotions they still maybe had one or two that could generously be described as a territory because they ran somewhat of a full schedule for the era or had local television. And, and that was a, a stretch. They were joining the NWA at that point and over a period of that time in a concerted effort to try to have a touring world champion that might mean something. And the Dan Severn, he had a name, those that era. But now, I mean, my God, it, all of the top talent in the business is either signed to WWE and their various programs, AEW and wherever the witness protection program is that they put a lot of their guys in, Impact's got a bunch, and, well, and Tony bought Ring of Honor and whatever contracts were there. And who's running any of these other promotions that do anything but run their hometown on their birthday? So, so it, it's a marketing thing to get EC3's promotion over, make it sound big. But this can't be a revival of something that the to revive it, these things would have to exist. And there would have to be of at least some number of quality young talent committed to these things that's not on the other promotions. And it would take years to find the people alone that could... Basically, the summation of the whole thing, in my mind, is that it's a great marketing strategy or presentation for EC3's promotion, but as far as an actual territory system ever coming back for anybody nwa or anybody else where are you going to go out and find and or worse teach people how to run a territory and where are you going to find the money to invest in all these different places to get the televisions lined up and to uh, make deals with buildings for a regular schedule and then where are you going to find the talent I use that term even loosely to populate even three or four different places and them understand how to work territories for that specific market. And by the time that you found and or squatted down and shit all those people and that don't exist and spent all that money, we're talking, how much time does that take? Years. It took us, you know, several years from the time that Danny Davis started OVW to the time that it was expanded enough to be somewhat considered a territory was several years, and everybody involved knew what they were doing. They just didn't have a lot of money. But it's not possible, is what I'm saying to you. But it's good marketing for that promotion's launch or if he's had it, continuation or whatever. See what I'm saying to you, Brian? Yeah, didn't EC3 of that other promotion control your narrative? Was it him? Well, he lost uh, voiceover artists for the narrative because Brown Strongman went back to... Where the fuck is he now, by the way? He's uh, injured. 
Jeez, I thought he was indestructible. He was beating up buses. So well, anyway, he, I think EC3 lost all of the uh, the people that were doing it with him, I guess, because they dispersed or whatever. They couldn't they couldn't control the narrative. It could be control your blank, and that could be a nice little marketing campaign there. But I guess there's a difference between actual a territory system and licensing initials or allowing people to be affiliates or franchisees, however you want to put it. I think they kind of hit their sweet spot that maybe they had something when it was a traveling world champion that was a credible quality athlete to the various independent promotions that were joining the NWA to be able to get a touring world champion that was, you know, somewhat of a name and a talent that would come into your promotion to make your top guy look good. That was kind of the sweet spot in the middle. You know, I think that maybe they've they've gone off the deep end here with trying to be a little grandiose. Not that they're the only promoters that, you know, are going off the deep end these days, but you know what I'm saying. Maybe you're looking at it the wrong way. Maybe EC3 is the Orville Brown of the modern era, but let me ask you this. In that case, don't ride in a car with him. Well, I did see online before that, I guess. Too soon? Too soon. Too soon. Well, I did see something online uh, before that the NWA announced that they have two TV deals they've locked up with top 20 stations. Yeah, I, I heard about uh, the two TV deals. One's for a 62-inch, the other one's for a 75-inch. They've made them both at the same time so they'll get delivered together. Do you go for the biggest TV whenever you can, or do you see any value in having moderate-sized televisions? Well, there's no sense in, in doing anything halfway. I didn't say um, halfway. Well, if you've got a moderate-sized television, when you've got a space for a big television, I think you should have a smaller or moderate-sized television if that's the space you have for it. But if you got some room to spread out, let's go for the drive-in movie screen. What Are you, are you a fan of um, projectors in the home? No, no. Though, uh, between the whole projection fucking apparatus and or those old projection style big screens that shit weighs a goddamn ton and it's always either impossible to maneuver around or you you got to go too fucking uh far with the wiring or whatever i prefer the your standard your 75 your 85 inch no sense trying to show off with anything bigger than that but but not every room is good for that that's my point well, then knock a wall out. <laughs> no, not every, not every home is ready to have a wall knocked out. Well, ready or not, here they come. They got to get that TV in there. You can make the TV your wall. Let's say you got a room with a, a wall. It's only about six, seven feet or whatever. Get you a big screen TV and just stick that right up there and there's your wall. I wonder if someone's ever tried that. But Jim, let's stay on the topic of TV. It was a big Tuesday night on TV this week. NXT, on their usual night, had competition from AEW being moved to Tuesday night due to preemptions on TBS, and it wasn't just a head-to-head -head competition, as we will talk about later. Tony Khan seemed to have a lot invested in this personally, <laughs> and because of that, it started getting built up as being probably a bigger deal than it should have been, because it wasn't their night to begin with, but Tuesday night, AEW versus NXT... Uh, before we even talked about the reviews, any overall thoughts? Well, anybody with a sane level head predicted, basically us, I think, I don't know if anybody else did, but us, we did, that it the, the show that moves nights is already at a disadvantage because that's not the regular pattern. Christine Jarrett, wrestling fans are creatures of habit. and. At the same time, not only as we've mentioned in the past, because WWE obviously wanted to stick it to them, and why would it? It's got their com a competing promotion was when Macy's and Gimbals and whatever the fuck, right? But besides that, they're jacking up the ratings on everything as best they can with the stars and the and the moons and the suns and the planets because of the TV rights. And they're on a roll. So they're going to fucking 
ju- and they've already been juicing NXT up when it was just on Tuesday night and not in opposition to AEW. So why was any of this a surprise? Instead of Tony mounting this goddamn tilt at the windmill, am I getting too goddamn possibly these references becoming now too? I love it. I love okay. it. Okay. <laughs> but instead of him charging up, instead of making himself Don Quixote, he he sh- said, "Look, we're being thrown a curve by being uh, you know bumped off our regular night because of the the live sports press, whatever the fuck bumped him. I don't give a shit. But we're gonna have Titty Tuesday, or what do you call it, Title Tuesday, and we're gonna have a great program. Instead, he made it." Like, we're going to finally slay the dragon. They can't fuck with us. And so I think that the the side that for every logical indication of the wrestling business throughout history, the side that was going to lose this just because they were the ones encroaching on the other one's night, ended up making it to goddamn, you know, Armageddon and and they got Armageddon it. Well, very good. A reference to the clash there. But Jim, let's start with AEW Dynamite on Tuesday, October. What was it now? Tenth. The tenth. Yes. AEW Dynamite. Where were they? Um. Goddamn, I forgot to fucking pay attention to where they were. Yeah, I can't remember either. They were they were sitting firmly in a piss hole in a snowbank. And I mean, it, w- when we talk about the ratings, we will see what goes on here, but I thought it was kind of odd that they started this head-to-head, even though Christian Cage is one of the better promos, not only there, but anywhere right now. A static shot, one camera in the truck of Christian standing there doing a promo, and I wrote, why not? He can talk better than most of the wrestlers, or, you know, most of the wrestlers on the roster. But it's just, it's a static shot of him promoing the show with none of the crew in the TV truck almost moving a muscle. And and uh, until he told him, okay, start the show, and then they jump into action. Was that kind of a, even though he was billboarding the big matches and, and promoing them, was that kind of a way to start a head-to-head, you know, Armageddon battle? No, and why was he in the truck? It's one thing if it's Triple H, it's one thing if it's Tony Khan, if it's someone who's involved with the production in the truck instead of just the heels standing there <laughs> as the host of the show. And now let's start the show. Hit the button, yeah, Don. Being, not only being humored to in, interrupt the goddamn activities in the broadcast truck, but calling them. Okay. So getting that out of the way, I just had to mention it. The first match, and this was an excellent choice, was Brian Danielson against Swerve Strickland. Because I think this was the best match of both shows on that night. Just in summation, which, you know, before we talk about details. Because, again, it's Danielson. And he controlled Swerve's worst instincts to become a, an aggressive parkourist. And instead, it was wrestling, and it worked, and it didn't look completely preposterous. Except when Aubrey Ed was standing there, when they were fighting on the apron, she was just standing there, mouth agape, like they were in the ring, not counting or anything. That's not just her, though. That's every referee in AEW. Well, but she has a more agape mouth. Because she doesn't wear her bridle when she's refereeing, so she's all the way open with it, right? Why the long face? So they were outside the ring, you say? Yeah, they were over (laughs) on that apron. And, you know, and they did. Again, Danielson has, he has matches where modern style stuff goes into them, but they still don't look preposterous. And it's somewhat controlled danger. And, you know, at the same point, He's taking more risks than one would think one would for, with his concussion history, but he's having the safest, as contradictory as this may sound, to me, the safest modern matches, at least on his part, Swerve took a couple of risks here that, you know, that you can have and still perform at this level. And Swerve, 
again, when he's not just cartwheeling his way into a fucking swing dance routine, he's a good wrestler. So I think the, you know, the the match of the night for what and we'll see when we dissect the ratings for whatever that's worth has to go to Danielson and Swerve. And now I will say one thing. When later on, when they were really getting into the two counts and the big pops, you know, I've knocked Aubrey Ed in the past, you know, for trying to put the attention on herself. Like, what is she? You know, she's some kind of thoroughbred racehorse. But apparently with these gestures now she's doing, I think she's given up racing for the Royal Lippets on Stallions because she's just kind of posing in <laughs> different ways. But anyway, so they get to the finish, and I'll let you get your thoughts in here, Brian. Of course, yeah. Because I'm in one of those moods today, <laughs> as you can tell. They get they get to the finish. They get a couple of two counts, big pops. And then finally, Swerve gets a two count, and Nana, Prince Nana, flips out and draws Aubrey Ed over there. So Swerve gets the crown. Now, I've I never handled the crown, but I've been standing next to Nana when he was wearing the crown. I wasn't aware it would serve as brass knuckles, but apparently it seemed more like gold lame sequins in an arrangement that would fit over nana i love nana we're we're good friends but i don't think his crown's brass knuckles but nevertheless he gets the crown swerve does and he's gonna do something nefarious when suddenly hangnail page appears at ringside and snatches it and at that point swerve with mouth agape has his back to danielson and danielson gets a roll up on him and only gets a two count and then hits him with the knee and gets the three count. And I was, again, I love the match. Maybe Swerve's best match I've seen him have. Great stuff. We were 21 minutes into the show and it hadn't got boring. But if the guy turns around, he's like, what the fuck? Why not just roll him up? Why get the two count or hit him with the knee and get the three count? Why do both? I, did, I didn't understand there what we were doing there. But otherwise, what are your thoughts, young Brian? I thought it was good. I didn't think it was as great as other people did, but I thought it was really good. I have a problem with Swerve losing here. Why is Swerve losing this match? Well, because Tony told him to. No, but you know what I mean. He just <laughs> beat Adam Page, and that was something that I thought elevated him. People got behind him. He was good in the promos. He made Adam Page look foolish in everything he did, and he was good in the match. And then they followed up with him losing the next week on TV. I think that's a mistake. Yeah. Well, I didn't say it wasn't. But now here's the thing. Tony has said Brian's going to be the one to take over running this fucking circus when, you know, something happens to him and, and we may be closer than ever, poor thing. Bless his little pee-picking heart. So much like he he wouldn't beat Pockets until Pockets ran up a victory string of about 40 something at least with brian danielson he's an actual goddamn real wrestling star instead of the company mascot so he'll probably never lose again well he's lost to other people he lost to daniel garcia for god's sake so well but that was before now tony is feeling his own mortality apparently he's already left Bri young he may adopt brian Tony may end up the grandfather of what little birdie and who, who, what are the children's names? I can't remember. It'd been funnier if I could, but you think they'll, they're grandpa, Tony, that'll make Shad a great grandfather. Well, I think part of the problem is if you wanted Danielson to go over, it could have been anyone else. It didn't need to be swerve because swerve should only be going over right now, but that wouldn't be a dream match to put on titty Tuesday to tantalize the taints of all of the NXT fans to come over and watch their program. See? I see. Moving on, Samoa Joe, again, promo looks fantastic. We we can't add anything to that. It's so They're brief, but they're lovely. But then, what did you think of Chris Jericho versus Powerhouse Hobbs, now a member of the Don Fallis family. It went probably a little longer than it should have, considering what the result was mm -hmm. and how they put him over. But, I mean, Jericho put over Powerhouse Hobbs, and he didn't do it in a way that didn't make it have impact. It was the opposite. 
It so all, uh, all that Hobbs has needed for the past four years was to get rid of QT Marshall and get a hold of Don Fallis. That was the, the magic. Now that he's in the inner circle, then he, he becomes a monster and a beast. And I, that's the only thing I can say is that the last time that Jericho started firing up, I was like, now, wait a minute. Just because of the damage that he had suffered through this whole thing, but it was really, it was all Hobbs. It was like, maybe this was Jericho's homage to Inoki when he, you know, he made the, the monster by Vader just beating the shit out of him. Although I think that was a little more one-sided than this was, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the way it should be done, probably, a little better than this one was. It was probably modeled, this one was probably modeled after that one, now that I think about it. Yeah, but that's the thing is, it, Hobbs got on him with a spine buster in the first 30 seconds, and for the most part, with except for, I think, three times, and it may should have been twice, Jericho firing back up from underneath with, you know, some Hail Marys, he just beat the shit out of him. I think five spine busters, and then... What was it? I tried to make note. No, six spine busters. And then uh, a couple of those power slams that look good because he's not doing the same thing everybody else does. He's flattening out with it. And uh, and boom. I think, yeah, when Jericho got the walls, I was like, I don't know, because it's his back too. But a couple of power slams and a knee on the face later, one, two, three. And... It, I think Jericho stuck to shit that he knew Hobbs could do. Instead of, that's why six spine busters and a couple or three power slams, because they looked, you know, incredible, and the guy's a beast, and it didn't get too complicated, and the whole point of the thing was not for him to show his, you know, varying repertoire, but to be a fucking badass and smash this fucking guy so for that uh i i wait a minute for once i'm gonna give old chris up oh, wait up oh, my sound effect don't work. wait a minute Good. i'll give him a, thank god i'll give him a smaller smatter smattering of applause yeah that was recorded at an FFA meeting over in Hopkinsville that my Uncle Dink attended. I just think it went too long. I think Jericho didn't need to get as much in considering what the result was, what it was supposed to do. Yeah. It wasn't going to hurt him if he didn't get the walls of Jericho. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's my only thing. I just think for what it was, it didn't, you know, there was some stuff that just seemed like it, it was there for no reason. But then Hobbs broke the walls of Jericho and it all came tumbling down. And then he gave him another power slam. That's right. Well, you know, Jim, one other thing I want to say, maybe Powerhouse Hobbs coming out of that match wants to go sit back and watch that match over and over again in his chair. Maybe he wants to watch it so often that he's just going to decide to lay back and go to sleep and then <laughs> prop himself back up. He's going to watch it over and over and over again. And we have someone who can help him do that. What he wants to do is he wants to study it because he's beaten one of the biggest stars in the history of the modern wrestling industry and he wants to he wants to break down exactly how he did that so he wants a comfortable place where he can crank back with his notepad and study that thing over and over again like a forensic scientist but if you want a comfortable place that you can do anything we're talking watching all these boring wrestling shows we're talking about watching sports we're talking about watching movies we're talking about staring out the window and Watching dogs fuck each other. It doesn't matter, ladies no, and gentlemen. we're not talking about that for the record. Well, it, if it's there, what are you going to do? Go spray them with a hose? Why do we have to talk about that now? You could be giving so many I'm other just, examples. Why does your mind go there? I'm just saying, if you're looking out your window and you're saying, boy, I'm so comfortable, chances are you are sitting in the perfect sleep chair. And these folks, they're our brand new friends. And boy, now you, Brian, and I have the perfect sleep chair in our various uh, manors and castles. It's nice, and isn't it? And they do everything. It's a big, comfortable, pu cushy, pushy, cushy recliner that is just like sitting in a bunch of pillows, but by the various 
contraptions and and remotes and uh, controls that this thing has. You can lay all the way back flat. You can put your feet up. You can vibrate your back. You can vibrate your seat. You can crank down into TV watching mode. It will stand you up out of this. It'll just, it'll throw you right straight through the window if you want it to. It will do everything. You do not have to move a muscle. As a matter of fact, I got the jumbo edition where when I'm laying back there watching television, a robotic arm comes out of the right hand side and sticks Reese cups in my mouth and then rubs my neck so I don't have to chew. That is not a feature they offer. That is something independently well, that's something that you have done from some bootleg person. It's, it's, it's experimental. It's experimental now. And they're I'm, they're really? checking it out on me. Who's that? But I, well, the perfect sleep no, chair. See, no, That's they are not having any involvement with your robotic arm and your peanut butter cups. Well, you ought to see what else that robotic arm does. But folks, if you want to upgrade from your couch to first class, do it with the perfect sleep chair. It can do everything. As I meant, did I mention the heat? It'll heat you up. Couple of different set, a couple of different degrees. You can, as a matter of fact, if you're freezing this winter. Turn this son of a gun all the way up, and you will be fried, died, and laid to the side in 30 minutes. They should do a commercial with Austin Idol sitting in the chair. Is there heat? And then all yeah, of a sudden, the heat I can comes feel on. it. It's not scalding, <laughs> but it's on my sciatica. There's an infinite number of positions from uh, that you can adjust to, as I mentioned, to a lift position. So you can ease right out, and and if you get once you stand up, you're on your own. If you don't take over from there, you're gonna fall right on your face. But they'll get you halfway. The perfect sleep chair is made by Journey Health and Lifestyle, which has been making health and home products for over 20 years, and so they know all about your home and your health, and that's why they put this in your home to help with your health. And they've got an A plus Better Business Bureau rating. From all of the people, well, you know why? Because the, once the people get in the perfect sleep chair, they go to sleep. And then if they have any complaints, they're too busy snoring away to register them with the Better Business Bureau. And have you gotten the kids out of the thing yet, Brian, so you can enjoy it when you crank back and watch the, uh, what's your team, the Nets up there, the New York no, Nets? No, the New York Mets. I'm not a Nets fan. That's a different team. I watched the Mets. Uh, well, the, the Mets are not really playing right now. It's a uh, playoff baseball. The Mets didn't uh, make it this year. But I have been using uh -huh. the chair. And in fact, I like it so much, I would be broadcasting from it if the wonderful vibration didn't make so much noise that would drive me crazy. The, well, you know, that's because then you'd have background noise. But I'll tell you, folks, if you want to vibrate, boy, this thing will rattle your teeth if you want to. You just w feel those Aches and pains in your muscles melt away while your brain and your mind is melting away watching the wrestling programs. The perfect sleep chair is the perfect chair to do it. A variety of color choices, I understand, fits the decor of any home. Of course, my, my home has no set decor. We just put things in willy-nilly. But if you want to pick one, it's up to you. Several fabrics. They've got leather. We mentioned that. The as a matter of fact, the, the entire cattle industry has been boosted by the 100,000 perfect sleep chairs that these fine folks have sold. So if you want one this fall, or perhaps one that you won't fall out of, the perfect sleep chair, you go to Shop Journey. Shop J Journey as in the group formerly led by Steve Perry. Shopjourney.com. Every chair you wanted. Every <laughs> God damn you, you thought of that first. <laughs> I know like five Journey songs, so I'm trying to rotate the word chair into every one of them. <laughs> when the lights go down in your living room and the perfect sleep chair cranks back into bed mode. <laughs> You'll go to sleep and dream of San Francisco. Oh, 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 oh. So where you're going <laughs> is shopjourney.com slash JCE and use the promo code JCE at checkout for, get this, $125 off the chair or off your order, whatever you order. 
So 125 bucks, that's that's a big time deal. Shopjourney.com slash JCE and check out this. I mean, you really, a lot of people are asking now to be buried in this chair because it's a perfect send off. You can put yourself in any position and they can just put the box that it comes in back over the top of you and then off you go. The people who deliver the chair will take the box with them. You do not have to worry about a giant box in your living room. Well, only if you've got a dead body you need to put in it. The, no, well, I don't. Again, I don't know why your mind went here in the middle of well, this. Well, it's so people want to go to eternity, and this is not just some pine box you're going to be laying in. We're this not is a place you'd want to be in for the rest of however long that may be. Let's talk about the living and let's talk about living and enjoying a let's perfect sleep chair. Let's talk about living it up, living it up, oh yeah, Friday night, living it up on a perfect sleep chair. That's what you can do. What's the promo code, Jim? Shopjourney.com slash JCE, promo code JCE at checkout for $125 off that fine order. Perfect sleep chair. And keep the box just in case. You never know when something might happen to you. Well, Jim, back to, uh, I guess, wake up. It's time to go back to dynamite. Well, all right. The Adam Cole, Roderick Strong, just for the folks who missed it, and if it's, it would be the best thing for AEW if everyone had missed this, or at least for the talent involved. They're in the backyard of Roderick Strong's house, apparently somewhere where there is no cell service. So Adam Cole has been there for a week and he's saying, boy, I really need to go get this surgery. Like he's just going to show up at, at like at, at Walmart. <laughs> They're waiting for right? him. He's going to run over <laughs> to the Walmart pharmacy to get this goddamn ankle surgery. They've been waiting on him for a week or whatever. It, I really got to go get this surgery, Roddy. What else do you need? And... So Roddy is obviously there in the wheelchair, the hospital gown, the neck brace, and Taven and Bennett standing with him, and they do a slow-mo montage to rotten music of Adam Cole in pain with his one leg on his fucking, I don't know what you call those scooters that he's ambling around because he's got the bad leg, cutting Adam Cole's lawn with the lawnmowers and the various things. And this, then they were inside the house playing with a stuffed giraffe. And I wrote, this may be the worst shit AEW has ever done, underlining AEW as to put emphasis on that, indicating that they've done a bunch of rotten shit. But then, and Roddy has no TVs in the house, so that's why Adam Cole can't watch his friend MJF. And by the way, MJF's going to be involved in this later on, so he is, he's got a goddamn rope around his neck, and he better be holding on to the side of the Titanic, because this thing could drag him down too, as if he didn't have enough buzzard circling at the moment. God damn all this shit. Ah, oh! So... There's no TVs. He doesn't know what's going on in the world of dynamite because there's no cell service. And he's just willingly, while in need of emergency surgery, cutting this motherfucker's grass. This is goddamn. And they're making funny faces at the same time. And then Roddy wants, as he goes to get his overdue, that was a word. It's This is surgery's overdue, Roddy. I got to go. One more thing, Adam. And they go... <sighs> To, it's good that Adam Cole will be off for a while. So maybe the taste will be removed from people's mouths whenever they quit doing whatever the fuck this is supposed to be. Taven and Bennett are dead. And as I mentioned, they're trying to yank the current reigning and defending AEW world champion off the side of the fucking ship into the goddamn shark infested waters with them. What were your thoughts on this fiasco? This stuff has been horrible. It's getting worse by the week. Roddy Strong went from finally showing some personality to going over the top with the silliness and the screaming of Adam. And Adam Cole doesn't come out of this looking any better. He looks like a moron, and he's acting it up in this, and it's just this bad... Like, it's hard to even call it humor because there are no funny moments 
No. I guess unless maybe you know these people, you know, and then maybe and it's I, a- I, I know of pretty much all of them. And no, it's not funny. It's sad. There's no reason for this. There's no, but you know, did Tony Khan see the, the video of, of Garvin and sunshine having to wash David Von Erich's fucking dog and think I, I'll do something like this, but because he's not focused these days, he just, left it up to somebody. I don't know what the fuck. I don't have any idea what's going on here. But again, I think there's a lot of problems overall with AEW. I mean, a, lo- a ton of problems. I mean, as we are recording right now, people are sending me Tony's latest tweets. We'll talk oh, about them okay. later. There's a mm. lot of problems with the TV show. These skits, every now and then when one has popped up, people have been forgiving, but they've almost always been bad. Jericho in the inner circle in Las Vegas. Like all these skits, but now it's a regular recurring thing, possibly to keep Adam on the show, possibly so talent get to do things they enjoy doing during the day. I really don't know why these are getting on the show, but they're bad. And I think the more they keep relying on this kind of shit, the more they're turning off, they're turning off their fans. And as a company, they're spending money to make their show look bad and their talent look like idiots. Because I don't care if the talent wants to do it or not. Oh, let's go over to Roddy's house and shoot a video. There are obviously people there to set up the fucking audio to make sure the lighting can even be aired. There's a there's a crew. Then they got to go and edit it. And that takes up time in the fucking edit bay and whatever the fuck. Some, they're paying something for this. This is not just free shit they're shooting on their phone. I mean, someone sat there and said, hey, what should we do? How about we have it so that, like, Adam does whatever Roddy wants, and Roddy has people there, but they don't help him, but Adam does, and, like, he can make him do the lawn stuff, and Adam, he keeps wanting to go to surgery. Like, it sounds awful as I'm saying it out loud. <laughs> it just sounds terrible, and that's what they're doing. They're doing terrible shit in these segments. Terrible. Well, and, and later on, MJF is going to be the spurned paramour here later on. Can't wait for that in the program. Boy, I can't wait when we dissect these quarter hours. And uh, it was at that point that the breaking news came in that the plumber has not been cleared. Apparently, he did not pass his bar exam for plumbers. Uh, no, he wasn't medically cleared because the guy that wasn't supposed to win the title from him, but did, and dropped him on his head and gave him a concussion two weeks ago, he still can't wrestle. So now, the aforementioned guy who dropped the guy on his head will defend the title that he wasn't supposed to win against the trained chimpanzee that the plumber beat for the belt to begin with. In order, people think in order for him to win it back from him that the whole idea of Moxley winning the belt from Orange Cassidy was for Orange Cassidy to get over more by winning it back from Moxley. That wasn't the end of Orange Cassidy. What? Yeah. No, I thought, the, I thought the idea was to put the belt on Moxley to start making it actually legitimate in some description because at least Moxley was a main event fucking name wrestler. and That's where it would stay. And then when idiot Felix dropped him on his head and then they had another 10 minute match. And then Moxley said, Oh goddamn, just beat me. I figured that because they booked this rematch, they would put it back on the plumber because that's where it was still supposed to be to begin with. Right. I think with him eventually dropping it back to orange Cassidy, who the, what are you out of your fucking mind? They were going to do that. Why the fuck would anybody do that? Because, I mean, (laughs) for the kind of people who like the plumber, that's the kind of thing those people like, why would you ever have him do a job to the fucking mascot? Why are you waiting to the last minute to... I mean, they were still announcing that match. I mean, for days in advance, obviously, but up to the show, into the show. Why? I mean, you didn't know he wasn't going to be cleared? Doc Sampson went back there and dangled a pocket watch back and forth in front of his eyes or gave him a breathalyzer. I don't know how they fucking test people to see if they're medically cleared from being dropped on their head by a fucking idiot. 
All right, you seemed good yesterday. How you doing today? <laughs> yeah. Are you doing even where are we at right now? Just if you can narrow it down to the fucking county, we're okay. Cincinnati. Very close enough. You left there this morning. So, but but basically what they did was they then booked, as I said, they've gone round round the ring around the rosy with this thing. And so Pockets takes the place of Plummer against Felix. And obviously, it, it they started the program with Brian Danielson versus Swerve Strickland. In, and I never used the word great. I don't know if it was an all-time classic, but it was the best match given the most time and the most professionally orchestrated amongst the programs of the night. But they start with them. And 30 minutes later, it's a chimpanzee against a Mexican made entirely out of potatoes. They've gone full outlaw against the biggest stars in the goddamn industry on the other channel. So, did you? I'm, I didn't watch this, but as I was fast forwarding, Brian, did you see the greatest spot of all time? Because it was one of those deals on even on fast forward, you go, wait a minute, hold on. What what the fuck did they just do? No, I didn't watch any of this match. Okay. Well, I'm gonna describe the greatest spot. It was I watched it in slow motion 15 times. It was one of the you know how you get the ones where you just can't stop, right? Seeing it. So Felix has rocked pockets with something. And Pockets is staggered over next to the ropes. He's leaning kind of next to the ropes, and he's staggering. He's woozy. So Felix jumps up on a top rope on the turnbuckle, and he's going to do the thing where he runs the tightrope walk. He runs down the top rope and apparently going to just soccer kick uh, Pockets in the head, right? Well, he jumps up on the top rope, and old Pockets is standing there, and he can see him coming out of the corner of his eye. So when Felix runs down the top rope, he throws his right foot to kick Pockets in the head. Well, Pockets apparently either has had a bad experience with that in the past or mistimed something or whatever, because not only did he put his right arm up like he was going to, you know, just have that protection in front of his face to block it, but also he just finally at the last second said, fuck this, and ducked away from it, just like turned like, I don't want none of that. And fucking Felix, his kick went completely over fucking Pockets' head because Pockets is already like selling it like, oh, my God, I've just got hit. And he's turned away. And so Felix swings and hits nothing and loses his balance and is coming off the top rope into the ring and with his left knee drives it into the back of Pockets' fucking head and neck boom on the way down and drives him into the goddamn mat and they both fell in a fucking heap and the kick missed his head by like two fucking feet and they uh, but the knee didn't i was convinced that may have given him brain damage if you still have that on your dvr go back and watch that unfold it's fascinating and then Pockets won the belt back. Thank you for coming, Felix. So now they're back where they started from, except that one of their top guys has brain damage. In four weeks, they they are back where they fucking started from, except one of their fucking top talents still has lingering brain damage. Well, I didn't watch it, so I can't add too much. I am pulling it up right now on my computer so I can see the spot. It was just within a minute or so of the bell. Okay, he's on the rope now with the belt. Hold on, fast forward 30 seconds. They are chopping each other. Felix with a chop. OC with a forearm. They're going back and forth. These look like pillows. Oh, wow, Orange Cassidy's really laying in nothing. (laughs) So he lays in nothing, and the other guy just, oh, there's a pretty nice firm clothesline from Felix, Mexican wrestling star. (laughs) <laughs> there is a bunch of mat work into up. Oh, he's selling his back. And Orange Cassidy is going to use that to throw him into the ropes. He turns around 
And I don't know what kind of miscommunication happened there. He's on the rope. Oh, yeah. Wow. What the fuck was that? <laughs> what was that? Hold on. I got to rewind it. <laughs> what just happened there? He was throwing that kick and Pocket said, fuck it. I'm going to sell it before it gets here and get the fuck out of the way. No, but even right before it, it was like there were some... There was some kind of issues. Oh, well, yeah, before that, they didn't know what they were doing either. But this one was... Here we go. That he, was... He's doing it again. He goes to the rope. He's running. He's going to go do the kick. <laughs> he also, like, does a 360 Orange Cassidy as he goes down. Yes, because, well, it, partially he was being driven by the knee in the back of his head. All right. Mm. I like it. Anyway. You know what? I'll watch Ray Felix's match. Ray Felix. Ray Phoenix's matches every week if he's just going to be out there doing shoot moves. <laughs> <sighs> and of course, in this one, pockets somehow emerged unscathed. Okay. Um, timeless Tony Storm. Love the promo. But they just did a backstage promo where she said, I've I've done my new latest film. It's a short film and it's silent. And they played it in picture in picture, which apparently was just her getting getting up off of and sitting back down on furniture. So that Yeah, I can't add too much to it. That's exactly what it was. It was yeah. I in a way it was the perfect use of picture in picture, because no one wants to watch the wrestling in picture in picture. So but wouldn't get... you have done something? Wouldn't there have been something where she tried to throw the pie in someone's face or a takeoff of a classic silent movie scene? No, she's losing and... her mind. She's just filming herself by herself. Okay, then she could fucking... In a silent film. <laughs> then, then do something in your silent film. It was, she just sat on the fucking couch. So are we supposed to believe the character Tony Storm went to the production truck where obviously anyone can get in there. Christian's in there. And said, when I come out there, I want you to make everything black and white. Yes. Because otherwise everyone's playing along with this woman who's clearly losing her mind. That seems kind of cruel. I mean, you know, but I'm honestly, I don't mind that because at least for some effort at production, entrance, entertainment value on this program, I'll take the black and white. Is it, you know, at Gold Dust doing the cinematic entrance with the, uh, the the glitter and the blah blah blah, but uh, I want to see something. If she, if it's going to be a silent film, she needs to think she's doing something. She wasn't doing nothing there. With that said, it was the best use of picture in picture they've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Which again is like being the nicest guy in prison. That's right. So speaking of the nicest guy in prison. You'll never guess who came out and power bombed Matt Seidel five times and the referee stopped it. And then he left through the crowd. Powerhouse Hobbs. Wardlow. That's right. Okay, so this is was this a brand new part of the program or was this a VTR from 2020? Or 2021? Or last week. Remember, he returned last week. Who did he beat last week? Griff Garrison. And he well, did the yeah. same thing, and then he went through the crowd, yes. and now it's Matt Seidel, and now they're trying to, again, with Powerhouse Hobbs, and seemingly with Wardlow, it's probably too late, or possibly too late, who knows, but they're trying, it seems, to, like the Dallas episode where Bobby Ewing was in the shower, <laughs> like, ignore everything else that happened, this is the way we should have done it from the beginning. But at least it was only one season. With Dallas. This has been like two... He, he's doing the same thing he was doing three years ago. And in, and and they are admitting, yeah, well, that's the only time that people liked him. Because then we botched him up and we had him wearing ridiculous fucking clothing and fighting the security uh, guards. And then we just... We just make him go away and people wonder where he's at and then he comes back and does something else goofy and now so we'll just have him do the same thing that he, we had him doing three years ago can he not sue them for malpractice and get out of his fucking contract it is good though that this week he didn't just walk through the crowd back to where the podium was at least this time they had him go the opposite way which is kind of where moxley comes out of well yeah and one of these days they're going to cross paths over who gets the handicapped parking spot and then we're going to see some fireworks but uh, again, I'm not saying that 
It's not Wardlow's fault. It's just this is the only thing that they've been able to figure out have what to do with him. So now they're doing it again. Ogie dogie. Should we talk about Hangnail and Jay White? Well, there was a Jericho backstage thing where... Uh... Oh, that's right, that's right. He was, he was selling his neck. He was so hurt he couldn't get all the way to the trainer's office. And then Cool Hand Luke was going to check on him, but Daddy Max said, ah, fuck no, him. No, it was Daniel Garcia who was oh. checking on him. And he was concerned for him, but then uh, one of the 2.0 guys was mad about that. That was Daddy Mac. Yeah, yeah, Cool Hand Luke and Daniel Garcia look like each other, don't they? No. Well, then I just don't remember what either one of them really looks like. Well, basically, Jericho is friendless. It's what we've been led to believe here. He's friendless. Well, some of the nope. younger guys want to be his friends still. I guess that's the thing. Sammy did, well, Sammy turned on him, but Daniel Garcia yeah. now feels bad, and, you know, he uh, wants to dance with him. I don't know what, but... That was the oh, Jericho segment. Oh, I want to dance with somebody. Well, anyway, now we're going to talk about who's going to dance with Hangnail. Jay White. Why did the other heels in the gang, bang, bang, gang, gang, bang, gang, ba bang, bang, gang, bang, bang, gang, why did they come out on tricycles? I do not have an explanation. I don't know. Has there been anything mentioned in the programming as to why that the the top heel group, apparently, from what we're being led to believe here in the, by the booking, come out riding tricycles? The only previous mention I could think of with tricycles and wrestling was that week you mentioned them on the experience talking about the children's parking area at the hospital, that there'd be tricycles up there. Well, but that was in a completely different context. Maybe it so, inspired but, these guys. But now, were these some kind of cool, new, uh, you know, hip, modern modes of transportation that the young kids are doing? And, you know, and I just don't know it. Or was that actual kids' tricycles? They certainly weren't kids' tricycles, I don't think. And, uh, you know, the guns and Juice Robinson aren't exactly young. I don't know if I would say this is what the young kids are doing on these things. I think that they thought this would be something cool to do. I, I, I can't explain it to you. All right. Well, it's like a gang of children behind Jay White, who's the size of a child. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they started this match. Jay White showed him the belt and then slapped him and bailed out to the floor. And then they tied up and Jay White slapped him and bailed out to the floor. And then Hangnail did a dive, and they fought on the floor and went to the break. Okay, they came back right at the 9 o'clock hour. So this, apparently, Hangnail Page and Jay White is what they envisioned as big stars in their company that would garner a viewership at 9 o'clock. And again, you know, they're having a fucking match. I, I don't... Page has no oomph. I'm not thrilled with Jay White as a single. And at one point, Jay White gave Page the, the knee breaker on the apron like Flair used to do on his knee to set up for the figure four. And that looked like it could have really fucked his fucking knee up. And they went through two breaks on this thing. It just went so long. <laughs> they had to do the stuff where they fight on top gingerly with each other helping each other execute the move the flip off the top together page did his blind moonsault where he climbs up to the top and flips backwards off and doesn't even check to see if the guy's still standing there and i wrote it white does shit to does shit to white this will not end and then page had been selling his leg in between times where he wasn't and finally, he bobbled on a buckshot, but hit the dead eye and got a two count. And the heels drew the referee and non distracted Page and White schoolboyed him. One, two, three. And I thought, okay, at least, thank God, this is over. But it wasn't. Because then suddenly, Page gets to chase Prince Nana off, but the Bullet Club... Gold is still in the ring. 
and MJF's music plays. Before we go any further, any final comments on Paige and what you call it? I can't add too much more. You know, Paige is just cold as ice right now. You know, the elite fans still pop for him, but, you know, this guy walking out there like he has shit in his pants. He's a former world champion. <laughs> and he really doesn't mean that much on this show. And Jay White, they've been trying to do something with him. We'll see if it works here. There are people that were really anticipating this match. I didn't think it was that special. Well, but unfortunately, as I said, the whole thing wasn't over there. MJF came out. The uh, bangers are in the ring. And now MJF is obviously pissed off at Jay White and wants his belt back. The big blueberry belt that, you know, a, that uh, MJF owns, but Jay White has stolen. Burberry. Not blueberry. What now? You said blueberry. It's not blueberry. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I do apologize for missing the big blackberry belt. So, anyway, <sighs> Brian, we're not the only ones that have been knocking and talking about these long bullet club segments, Jay White droning on and on. So they do more of them. And now he's blown up from the match. Now he's got to start the promo on his knees. <laughs> But he's got all of his guys in the ring with him. And he won't get to the point. At one point, he told the fans to shush, but not even like Gable, shush, but just shush. Like that's a thing he says in real life. And the fans responded, shut the fuck up. And MJF cut a promo to try to get Jay White over as a heel and how that MJF is trying to be a better man and earn the fans' respect. And he got fired up because, again, you can tell when he starts trying too hard when people aren't with the other guy or against the other guy or interested in the other guy, I should say. And he started getting bleeped. But it, the thing, it was too much praising about how great Jay White was to try to make him legitimate when that's not MJF's gimmick. He shouldn't be saying good things about people. That's what got him over to begin with, was not saying good things about people. And again, this went back and forth. So like the whiny, high-pitched British fucking squeal that Jay White has, and somehow they laid out a stipulation where Jay White said that MJF could win it from him on November 18th, the belt if he wants it, or take it from him tonight with all four of them, or find three partners that can tolerate him because MJF has no friends. So I think he said if they win an eight-man tag, he can have the belt back. Did you get that? Kind of, yeah. And it, But it wasn't clear. No, Jay White has not been clear on the mic, and I know there's people who think he's really good because of the press conferences he does after the New Japan shows, but like the time where him and MJF went back and forth, and I have to say this, I apologize for any noise behind me. Someone's going to say, oh, we don't hear anything. The neighbor's gardeners are here. I swear to God, they have helicopters. So if you don't hear it, it's your problem. Back to Jay White. The MJF thing with him, everything was like, I am... The best I am. Like, he doesn't say anything. He's just like throwing out phrases about himself. There's nothing being done to establish him. I mean, I think most people would think Juice Robinson was the leader of Bullet Club Gold if they weren't told it was Jay White. Well, and there's the problem. They, the Bang Bang Gang uh, may need a new leader because then it was left to Juice to create the controversy. And for those of you who have been living under a rock, because I guess this got picked up by mainstream news outlets, as they say, Juice then, while MJF is in the entrance way and all the heels are in the ring, Juice pulls out a roll of quarters as a present for MJF because next week they're going to be in a battle royal for a shot at the fucking diamond ring, the chased cat that ate the rat. And now. He's telling him he's got a roll of quarters with his name on him, MJF's name on him, and he's going to use that to knock him out and win the... And he actually shows 
on, clo on lingering close-up, a roll of quarters with Friedman written on them in black Sharpie. And at that, MJF loses his mind and gets bleeped again, and there's going to be an issue with language because you can tell now the network is trying. Over in WWE land, they're bleeping shit from the crowd. And they do it well. But over here, they're saying fuck all the time. And they're trying to bleep well, it, and they're not always doing it. It is basic cable, though, as compared to SmackDown on Fox. Well, but but if the network wanted it, they wouldn't be trying to bleep it, would they? No. Okay. So anyway, MJF left, and Jay White was still fucking talking. But the whole bone of contention amongst everybody that saw this and how could you not think of this is the connotation yes it ties in with mjf's storyline where he was bullied and people threw quarters at him that he's told on television but as abdullah the butcher used to say timing is everything and they just happened to pick the week that these fucking lunatics over there started a goddamn war. And they're killing people. The, in luna the, most the lunatics being ridiculous way. The lunatics yes. being Hamas. Hamas, yes. They yes, I, I, they're the only ones that have goddamn bombed and beheaded and shot and kidnapped people in the last week, aren't they? Have I missed something else going on? No, but you gotta clarify who the bad guys are, I think, on this. <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't in this case. I don't give a shit. You don't have to clarify shit. The people who kidnap babies, behead people, and bomb civilians and orphanages are pretty much the fucking bad guys. Is this an argument? No, I Is don't think an it's an argument. But if you don't actually say that, if you just say that, people are going to jump to the assumption that you're being vague on this. I'm not being vague on anything. Fuck these fucking people. Hamas. And anybody who fucking is on the goddamn side, how can you be on this side, you fucking lunatics? If you're on that side, you should be ashamed of that side and switch sides. So, but the point being, they Muhammad hassan the issue here. I had Mark Magnus, an Italian-American young man with a great body and a wonderful worker and a tremendous attitude from upstate New York, but boy, he had a wonderfully dark skin and very clear as well. I'm, I'm sure he, he used treatments. And they decided to make him a fucking Arab terrorist. Muhammad Hassan. And as everybody will recall, this was still, this was almost 20 years ago, or may have been 20 years ago, but they have him try to behead the Undertaker with piano wire the same week that some of these real goddamn terrorists tried to behead people with piano wire. Am I correct in this? I forget what exact thing uh, was happening I'm in the news that sure week. I'm pretty sure it was some beheading it was something with like some that. piano wire. It was, it was a beheading or it was something like that, yeah. It still remains, to, it was the first and to my knowledge the only time that a network canceled a fucking wrestler's career. When Fox, it was on SmackDown and Fox said no, no more of him ever. And that, and that was that for, and thankfully, because he was a smart kid, and for years he's been a teacher and a fucking administrative school person and well thought of in his community up there in New York and actually associates with normal nice people instead of these fucking lunatics in the wrestling business. But nevertheless, it's you weren't going to have any other response but a backlash because of the timing of this happening and obviously because of the one-dimensional presentation. And I was talking to you earlier about this, actually off the air. We actually spoke off the air for once. I said, if, if, if Juice Robinson was not only known for using a roll of quarters to knock people out with, because that's an old wrestling trick, regardless of what religion or ethnicity you are it is a loaded punch that's been going on for a hundred years the gangster movies used to do it in the 30s 
if he had done that and it had been clearly established as something that this guy would do, and then instead of pulling it out and showing it with his name written on it, if in the course of a physical angle of some description, Juice Robinson had a knocked MJF out with the roll of quarters so that Jay White could then stand over him and once again taunt him, well, then you would have something that wouldn't just basically rub people's nose in the fact that you're trying to be goddamn edgy. Because I always said, heels have to be able to offend people to be heels, but not in this timing. Yeah, you couldn't, use the, the, you couldn't use the quarters at all right now because M no. MJF introduced the quarters into this lexicon of AEW with the anti-Semitic story. The story being bullied. He's told it a couple times. So any usage of the quarters here, no matter what it was, was going to take everyone back to that. Oh, it, it, it was good, but at least you would have some plausible deniability on the part of like when the Freebirds, when Watt said, well, they said the Freebirds said they didn't mean to put the hair cream in JYD's eyes. Yeah, but I, th I don't even think you... everybody with quarters if he hit him with quarters. I think if AEW did any... I think AEW, just like they saw the backlash with this, anything with the quarters would have gotten the backlash. This was especially bad because, like you said, the role of quarters didn't even say MJF. Freedman. Yeah, it's a Freedman. Who's ever called him Freedman on that show? No, no one. one. Except when, when illustrating his full name. Right. Apparently, Juice Robinson has been using the role of quarters for years. Now, you wouldn't know that if you're watching AEW, AEW TV. That's my point. So anyone who's saying, well, this clearly is just tying back not to MJF's thing, but the Juices thing. How would anyone watching this show know that? The only thing you know is MJF's quarter story. No one else is talking about fucking quarters in wrestling. The point is, it just, it was one dimensional. It was obvious what they were doing. It was in bad taste because of the timing. You know, it, because of, uh, you know, people actually getting killed. And it just, and, and every, nobody along that chain of command thought, eh, maybe the, the quarters is too much. That's the problem. Because even if you want to argue that MJF clearly is behind this because the quarter story is his, I don't think someone like that in his position would be doing something like this if it wasn't something he was behind or something he came up with or something he had played with. But he doesn't write the show, and he doesn't produce the show. And there are producers, and there are agents, and there's Tony Khan, and Juice Robinson. Just, be, just because you go to the producer or the writer or whatever and say, hey, how about if I bring a goddamn porcupine out to the ring and attempt to stuff it up my ass? No, someone there should have known, even if MJF wanted to do this, that you cannot do this. This is going to backfire. I think any logical person would have thought that. And they did it. And look, we, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but the other unfortunate thing is, by doing this, you take someone like Juice Robinson, who has showed a world of potential, who has more personality and charisma than most people on your roster, and you're still getting him established. You're now painting him as an anti-Semite. Yeah. Because there's no way he wouldn't know this. He wrote Friedman, not MJF. A very, an overtly Jewish last name he wrote on there. It ties into the quarter story. So now he's doing the same thing the anti-Semitic bullies did to MJF. He's not throwing him at him. He's taunting him with the quarters. You've painted Juice Robinson as an anti-Semite. Are the rest of the Bullet Club Gold anti-Semites? Did no one realize that's what this would be? Well, and now, but also, here's the thing, and I have been, obviously, in various training programs and, and promotions with young talent, and they all want to get over, and they all are hungry, and they all usually, many of them, have the best intentions about major things like that. But you can also, one person pitches something, and the other person who wants to get over too says, oh, what, I could do that anybody. And it grows, and it is up to the final authority, someone in charge, to say, no, we're not going to do that on television because of the network, because of the sponsors, because of taste, because of safety. 
because of the booking I planned, because of whatever reason, but there is nobody there to do that. And as a result, everybody looks like shit because now people are, you can't blame the heel anymore. It used to when people believed shit for the most part. If a heel said something too far on television, a promoter could say, well, yeah, that son of a gun, I'm firing him. And off he went. But the promoter didn't get the heat. Now everybody gets the heat because they know that there's, or they think that somebody's supposed to be in charge of this stuff. They don't really know there is nobody. But it goes on, the heat goes on everybody. And yeah. again, what, what would have been the response in the, in the production meeting, if somebody had blurted out, well, if, if it was Swerve out there, I'm going to bring out a watermelon with Swerve written on it. What would have been the reaction? No, it wouldn't have been Swerve doing it. It would have been someone taunting Swerve with it. Well, whatever the fuck, I'm just saying. Yeah, no, someone should have put their foot down. I mean, look, the problem is with doing this in any way right now, you know, there's a lot going on in the world. And every Jewish person, I'm assuming every Jewish wrestling fan that's thoughtful, is going through a lot. I mean, you turn on the news, it's just, it's your worst nightmare. And there's a harsh reality that we grow up with, and that's the fact that from the moment we're born, there are people who want us to die because we're Jewish. It's that simple. It's not about land, it's not about anything else. You're Jewish, you should die. That's what, there are people out there who believe that shit. So we're all going through all this stuff this week, and then they do this on AEW TV. This is our escape from all this stuff. Despite some of us hate watching it or laughing at it or mocking the people behind it, what these shows are really supposed to be, what any sport is supposed to be or entertainment is an escape, not to rub your face in it. And MJF is, I think you could say in a lot of ways, a hero to Jewish wrestling fans because look at everything he's achieved. Beyond the young age and everything, he's a Jewish kid from Long Island who's, what, 5'10", maybe? Look at what he's achieved on talent. So we want to get behind him, and we do. But when you see something like this, it just it breaks your heart because it's, it's using the anti-Semitism and the bad feeling we have to try to further this program of all programs. It doesn't make me hate the heel. It makes me hate the show. It doesn't make me want to see a match. It makes me want to turn the channel. And I'm the Jewish fan. I think a lot of Jewish fans felt that way. And that's the problem. It backfired even in that way. I don't think there were Jewish fans behind MJF. Like, yeah, go get them. No, we groaned. We said, why are you doing this? Mm. And, you know, it was, you know, I put it on Twitter. It was disgraceful. It was one of the worst things AEW, maybe the worst thing AEW has ever done on their show. And there are people who say, you know, it's bad no matter when you do it. It is. But especially the timing this week. I mean, as we are recording right now, friends of ours from the New York City Police Department who are high up have given us updates here about what's going on in the city. What police precincts are being mobilized because of threats. It's like that. Who's doing what in New York? Well, they, Hamas called for an international day of jihad. And because of that, the New York City Police Department, which is almost like a military. <laughs> Are these Hamas motherfuckers in New York City? They have sympathizers everywhere. That's the frustrating what thing. What the fuck? There's no... Comparison, there's false equivalencies. These people are subhuman and they want to kill Jewish people. It's not about land or anything else. It's about killing Jewish people. And like I said, in the midst of all this, AEW or WWE or anything else, that should be our escape. No one wants the harsh realities of this kind of hatred thrown in their face on a wrestling show. Not in 2023. And not in this way. And no one came out of, no one, from the people in the ring to MJF to Tony Khan to the producer. Tony Khan's been really active on Twitter. No apologies for this. I think no one comes out of this looking okay. And even if it's the world champion, and even if Tony Khan's behind the world champion, I would hope that one of the people who are producers or whatever 
would still be able to say, guys, this is a bad idea. Please don't do it. Because I think brief thought about this whole thing would have told anyone that this is a really, really bad idea. And you, let's see, you know, how they deal with it from here. But, you know, it was, it was, it was really, really a bad idea. It was really bad. Well, and, I, and MJF wasn't done tarnishing his reputation. They had a brief intermission while, who was it? Uh, Hikaru Shida beat Soraya for the women's title. So that was a... Good Lord. I guess she didn't change the game, so they changed the belt. And meanwhile, and, if, you, if you watch her in the ring, it's almost like she's going backwards now. You thought, like, okay, she gets back in the ring, she'll start getting, you know, the flow of things again. It's the opposite. She can't... She can't work with the modern women, it seems like, in wrestling. I don't know what the problem is, but in the ring, Soraya doesn't have it at all anymore. Well, I hate that. But moving onward, because then we were back to MJF with Rene Moxley Good. And now he was not in the mood to be interviewed because he was, you know, pissed off and upset and he needed to call his boy for advice. And he calls Adam Cole. And Adam answers this time. He's, where have you been? And you hear Adam say, I'm so sorry. Uh, Roddy still needs my help. And as MGF said, yeah, he needs your help. I've got this and that and the other thing going on. And Cole has shitty cell service and the phone or the call cuts off. And then the acclaimed and Billy Gunn walk in and offer to be his partners in whatever this eight-man showdown is going to be and then or at least caster does he hey we can be your partners but when mjf leaves billy gunn castigates caster for offering their services and caster well but he's my friend it's now it's uh, suddenly it's it's gone from the worst you know roast comedy taste to saved by the bell with the same fucking guy in it. Now, this is for 12-year-olds. What's going on here? Again, I don't know, and I'm going to treat this separate than the previous segment, but I'm going to treat this like the one last week. Remember, MJF was in the locker room uh, suffering the effects of the beatdown from Bullet Club Yeah, he got, he got the unauthorized neck rub from Mr. Caster. He acted freaked out. Caster acted like there was nothing wrong. Again, puzzling some of the things that get on this show. And now... He wants to be friends with MJF, so I assume we're going to eventually get, like I think I said before, MJF and the acclaimed and Billy Gunn versus Bullet Club Gold, and and then eventually maybe Roddy and the Kingdom and whoever they got. Oh, boy. All right, well, the main event that we have all been waiting for, everyone except the viewers of national television, um, and I, I hate that. I like most of the people involved in this, but my God, after this program, in the Edge, um, Adam Copeland wrestling debut on the show against Dino Douche there, but Christian Cage is obviously part of this whole thing. And they they sent Christian out to do, again, a, a nice in-ring promo about all of the, you know, the things that he's involved in, talking about being Nick Wayne and the Lizard's father instead of their leader and... You know, he referred to Edge not wanting to get back together when Christian was getting buried and Edge was getting pushed. But now that Christian is at the heights of his career and Edge is on the downward slope, you need me. Like a bird needs a tree, like a flower needs a bee, you need me. So anyway. Um, and by the way, apparently this ties back to the promo Edge did like whatever, 10 years ago, maybe more in WWE, where Christian was trying to be friends with him and Edge acted like a dick and turned on him or walked out yeah. on him. So they're tying back to something that was done in another company over 10 years ago that they can't completely reference. So it's hard to tie it all together. But they can allude to it. Yes. There's a lot of illusion here. And, uh, and, and then basically uh, Christian tells Beth Phoenix, who is Edge's... Uh, Mary, marital partner to put the clean sheets on the bed because the kid's new father is coming home. And then boy, Edge hits the ring and immediately Christian bails and Edge has got a face off with the lizard. 
and Nick Wayne grabs Edge's leg from behind and trips him. Every time I say Edge, just insert Adam Copeland. It's just my shorthand. And pretty much Dino comes from behind with the clothesline and not wallops Edge, and the referee comes in to check him, and they do the deal where he gets up very slowly until he gets the people behind him. Finally, the fans get with it, and then the referee rings the bell, and the match is on. And I've got to say, I've, we we had a bet. I said he'll probably whiff a bunch of shit trying to take care of Edge, and I think you said he'll probably knock him out. Kick him in the head, I think I said. Kick him in the head. I don't know that he really did either. Does anybody, do, do we owe each other any money? I didn't, I didn't see collecting on my part. I think we're square. I think we're square, but it was... It was safe and slow and deliberate heat on Edge. And Edge, again, as a pro, sells great and fights back from underneath. And then they still had to do some business with setting the stairs by the ring and trying to choke slam on the stairs and all that stuff. But finally, it, it, the, the story in, in summation was that Dino was more physically dominant, but Edge is more resourceful and etc and they had a decent match and again the lizard can be led somewhat and he was under control without doing any of the stupid where he just turns his back on people and starts back flipping or whatever but then finally christian and by the way they had a 10 minute overrun which was not only aired but also scheduled that was what the dvr was set for two hours and 10 minutes so christian draws the referee nick wayne puts the chair in the corner edge goes for a spear dino moves edge hits the spear choke slam two count holy shit it goes on and then there was a double kick and both of them went down and it was 10 10 and my dvr froze again I recorded that they had a 10 minute overrun. They still couldn't get it in. What happened? Oh, I, I don't remember past that <laughs> point. I was really unimpressed with the whole thing, to be honest with you. Adam uh, Copeland's just another guy in AEW now. Well, he is that because of the whole presentation of the thing. But I mean, anybody that can make me not write down 25 pages of notes on how bad the lizard is, had to be do a pretty good job of leading him through an acceptable contest. But I assume he won. But you can't assume... I think he did. I mean, I thought you knew that part when you asked me what happened. I believe he won the match. Oh, well, good. I'm glad to see he did that. But he may, yeah. have, been, he may have been a little beat up after the match. He may have wanted to lay down, and his body may have been sore. Not covered in sores, but a sore body. A sore body, which is not, uh, as you said, covered in sores, but just aches in a variety of places. That's what I mean, yes. Yes. Of course. Well, and, that's, and, and I'll tell you what, normally the solution to something like that over there in AEW is to have Max Caster sl slink in behind you and start rubbing your, your various appendages without you knowing he's there. But in this case... <laughs> It's not folks, the solution, ladies and That's gentlemen. not the solution for anything, no, because in this case, folks, if you have a problem with pain, physical pain after exercise or activity, or if you need more calm, you have stress and anxiety, or you need better sleep, well, it can all be addressed with the products that are proffered by our friends at CB Distilleries, because the benefits of CBD cannot be overstated cb distillery well the benefits of cbd no but you said cb distilleries as if there were CB multiple distilleries all over the place well they're 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 getting bigger but it's supposed they're to be one out but it's part of one unified it's, distillery it's, it's a unified distillery now don't talk about antitrust issues here no no i but wasn't C no cb distillery is the place you can go even if they have more than one outlet it's a central website cbdistillery.com so we can all be right here but the thing is the cbd is what we're talking about and the benefits of same from the hundred percent clean ingredients no artificial colors flavors or preservatives 
in the fine products here. And once again, 90% of customers report better sleep with CBD. 81% says CBD helps with stress and anxiety. 80% report less pain after physical activity. And 3% of the residents of New Jersey report not wanting to murder their internet service provider after taking the products from CB Distillery. That's not a proven statistic. Well, some people are outliers. But if you're frustrated with a health concern that's not getting better, folks, try CBD. Because if it doesn't make your health better, at least you'll be in such a good mood, you won't give a shit. And right now, thanks to the incredible full range of carefully formulated CBD and other plant-based solutions contained on the fine website, cbdistillery.com, you can join the over 2 million satisfied customers and 47 of them that are high as giraffe pussy and jump on right now to cbdistillery.com and enter the code JCE for a 20% discount. That's going to get you started right. You don't need a prescription. You don't have to spend any money on bribing doctors or medical professionals or go into business for yourself on forging anything. There's no prescription required. Go to cbdistillery.com, use the promo code JCE. You're going to get 20% off your, your entire order there of all these fine products that will help you enjoy better focus and concentration, less pain, more calm, more sleep, less misery. It'll even help you make money. Well, it doesn't do that. Don't say that. Well, it does, because if you focus and concentrate more, and you're calmer and address things in a reasonable manner, you'll be more successful in life and you'll make money. You can't guarantee that. I know plenty of focused, calm people that are broke. Well, you can't guarantee tomorrow either, but you might as well give it a try at cbdistillery.com, promo code JCE for 20% off. That's right, 20% off. Or on a Tuesday night this week, we called it more, 20% more wrestling. Like, yeah, it doesn't even make sense in terms that of math. That doesn't make a lick of sense. No, well, just... the transitions suck, and so does the wrestling, ladies and gentlemen. On to NXT. And I guess we're going to do the, uh, the ratings uh, comparison at the end of the thing where we do both of them at the same time. I think so. I think so. I think that'd be the fair way to do it. And again, while AEW had manufactured this, this, all or nothing, uh, you know, battle for supremacy on a Tuesday night it, because it was important to Tony and put such emphasis on it instead of, you know, at least leading their fans in with lowered expectations. You know, NXT drew upon its talent pool of some of the biggest names in the business that could come over and do little guest appearances or figure into refereeing or general manager or managing spots or whatever the case that would jazz up the normal NXT presentation, as is their ability and their right, because all these people work for them. So, and basically, again, it's the WWE. You didn't get a long, really athletic match like a Swerve and Danielson, but you got name stars that look like fucking stars that people are goddamn interested in, and you got uh, basically what uh, they do as much as they have to do in the ring to get the point across that they want to make, and they made them all. So... You know, you say kill with kindness or whatever. They'll, one company will bore you practically to death, but at the end of the thing, you remember exactly what they wanted you to remember. And the other company is so goddamn filled with chaos that it is more anxiety that you leave with than anything else. Like, oh shit, I'm shell shocked. All that shit going on. And it's important to note that they didn't just hot shot for the night against AEW. They did a little bit more, but they've been hot shotting just to build up the ratings because they're selling the rights to the show. Yes. And, I mean, you know, Becky Lynch has been in and out, and Dominic has been cross-promoting their North American title on the main programs and blah, blah, blah. So this is kind of a natural progression. And I'll, I'll make a point when we get to the ratings, but let's talk about the 
the program because they led again where Christian Cage is in the truck doing a one camera, you know, interview, not even interview, but the billboard of the show. Cody music, entrance, huge chance, welcome from the NXT crowd. What does yeet mean? It's a popular expression amongst the youth. Well, they did it. They said that a lot. They said yeet. Uh, they a did lot. it a lot. Yeah. Nonstop. And they're asking basically, I guess, you know, have you have you eaten? Yeet? But nevertheless, he's a Rhodes. He's <laughs> it's, a, it's a good answer. What, what do you want to talk about? Did you eat? Did you eat? It's the only thing you could say. There's no other answer. So what do you guys want to talk about? Yeah! That doesn't answer the question. Well, he he had a big announcement, is what he did. More than one, as a matter of fact. Um, Eddie, you know, something about the breakout tournaments. I think there's going to be a, a male tournament as well as a female tournament. And then they announced that the Dusty Rhodes tag team tournament will be coming back. And then, by the way, tonight he's had it approved. Cody Rhodes is going to be the special guest general manager of NXT tonight. And, of course, this is the... They're in their performance center or wherever they're at in NXT in Orlando. This is their regular audience, and they, this audience was cooperating with everything, but also in some cases, I think they got a little full of themselves and decided to go into business for themselves and be part of the special show too. But all of this is, and it's Cody, he's the biggest baby face to business. But then out came. Our boy Ilya Dragunov, and that's what when he when when Ilya gets in the ring, the fans chanted "Happy Birthday" at him. I think they probably could have let the poor guy do his promo instead of chanting "Happy Birthday" at him. Can I say something to you before you get going? Yes, I've enjoyed Ilya's matches when I've seen him. I was kind of disappointed he spoke perfect English. <laughs> well, that's but therein lies the problem. He speaks pretty perfect English, but it's still a second language to him legitimately because he is from Russia or that that part of the, the world. So, yeah, it is kind of a letdown because he still... Uh, Elia has always wanted to meet Cody, and he put him over and how great he was. And again, this is the NXT champion, and he's such a... A little fireball, a Tasmanian devil in the ring, but he's so polite and soft-spoken and perfectly spoken and looking up to Cody. I wasn't a fan of the way he was presented here. But then Dominic came out and knocked Elia. And now the fans, I thought it was Memphis that they yelled, whoop that trick. But now is that spreading around the world as well? Yeah. Well, apparently Dominic is a trick that the fans wanted to, to see whooped. And Elia said that he could turn a barking dog into a sweet little puppy. So the challenge was asked and answered. It was kind of long. I was hoping they'd get to it. And finally, when Cody got the opening, he made the match for tonight with Dominic and Elia. And the special referee will be L.A. Knight. So, again, in the first segment of this show, they got the most popular babyface in the business taking over the show, validating their title match, and sticking maybe the second most popular guy into it as a special referee. Not a bad way to open the program. Not a bad way in terms of star power and everything but it sucked i mean no one says anything nothing happens it's just oh like yeah a, it's like a mini raw now your music plays and you come out and i'm going to insult you with really <laughs> corny insults you i will tame you you dog no come on <laughs> so i mean it's it's nice but, for wwe but to me it was lame well of course because it's wwe but it made sense and there's and that's what people are looking for is to understand what the fuck's going on and see some stars they know who the fuck they are. At this point, that's all we can hope for. I, I hope I still hope for natural speaking. You know, that's the thing. I just want people to be able to do all of this. Book it all the same <laughs> way. Just let them talk 
in a natural way. I don't know if Cody can in real life, to be honest with you, but well, everyone else just speak in a normal way instead of telling them what to say and they go out there and they try to remember it and then they spit it out. It never sounds good even when it sounds, even when they read it right or say it right. So I just think, let these guys talk natural. Did you see how they were standing there? When Elia was talking to Cody, Elia was practically had his back turned to Cody and looking over his shoulder at him, talking to him so he could open up for the hard camera. I don't know. It was so unnatural looking. Everyone seemed uncomfortable. But speaking of discomfort, did you watch Roxanne Perez versus Oscar? I didn't because there was so much. It was Tuesday night and originally we were going to record a few days ago. So I tried yeah. to get it all in quickly. I didn't watch it. And then all of that all-night gas station opened up down the road. And by the way, the people probably never even noticed today where we stopped this program so that you could have the Infinity people come over and run you a new line from the goddamn road. Xfinity. Anything else you're disagreeing well, with? They've been very nice. I mean, I'm unhappy that since they updated everything, the service has been spotty. However, they sent out a well-equipped knowledgeable technician who was very interested in making sure Eddie, I was how happy. How do you know how well equipped he was? He had a truck filled with nuts and bolts. I don't know what the hell's going on out there. Well, I'm telling you, if he brought in his big heavy nuts, I'm sure he was well equipped. Well, it's not completely fixed, but hopefully it will be soon or else. But what are we talking about? Why are we... What were we talking we're, about? We're going back to uh, Oscar beat Roxanne Perez. Did you watch it? No. And then Shotzi jumped in and beat up another girl. I don't know who she was. And then there was a VTR of Heyman arriving in his big black SUV. And he gets out and, of course, can't find the right door and is, is very indignant about that. Does he do comedy the right way for wrestling because he's not in any way a comedic character? Yeah, because... It's funny because you think that it's legitimately happening to him and you like to see funny things happen to pompous people. He's not out there, you know? Adam! Anyway, should we talk about the, the pub rules match, which... <laughs> I was dying to know if you watched this. I, di I didn't watch all of it. I fast-forwarded some of it, obviously, but I had to get the the grip on what they were doing because I guess in a in some kind of concession to the AEW audience, they think, well, if we do a garbage wrestling match, then the people who like to watch garbage wrestling will watch this show, but good God. It was three guys with really thick accents and dressed in blah clothing, screaming about their match, and then Butch and Ridge and Tyler Bate, they couldn't have Seamus in this thing, started yelling about bangers. And then they had a, a six-man pub rules match, all six in the ring, no rules, no disqualification, lazy booking, with beer glasses and dartboards and uh, beer kegs and garbage cans and cue sticks, and it was a jump start 100 miles an hour in the entrance way, and just phony fucking shit. They did the fire extinguisher spot in the first two minutes. They had a bowling ball. Butch stuck a dart in some guy's fucking hand. It was a visual shit show, and it looked even more corny and phony and fake than the normal garbage matches they have in AEW where they use furniture and all that shit because WWE has the idea they've got to set the place up like a game show and have silly-looking props. So this was AEW-level bad with WWE-level bad set dressing. And then somebody got powerbombed through a bar and some peanuts, and... Sounds like Do a Saturday they... night. <laughs> In Newport. Do they do these matches on NXT normally, or is this was this just for any of the AEW audience to feel at home somehow with this shit? Yeah, do they do any of these matches in pubs? That's my other question. Was... I think that's what it was. You know, this... Other than, I guess, Butch and Ridge, although I kind of don't see them at that level, this is one of the only things on the show without 
main roster support, like big star main roster support. It so, needed it. So it was just a big garbage match to throw up against AEW. Well, and then they didn't even chant, we want tables. When they pulled out a table, the fans chanted, table, table, like it was one of the talents. And then they did, uh, well, they at one point they were doing the holy shit chant, the crowd, and you would think that the the fucking hometown audience down there that's regulars, that's there all the time, they could tell them, don't say shit, because the network is bleeping it. They're better bleepers than the AEW sound crew, but they're still, they're bleeping shit. And they're saying shit on the other channel and they're trying to bleep fuck and can't. Anyway, uh, heel got power bombed through a table. One, two, three. <sighs> I can't add it. I don't like these kind of matches. Yeah. There was a time I did, you know, if you were someone who like talked to me when I was a teenager, you're probably like, you're a hypocrite. Because every now and then you'd see a match like this, like the Nasty Boys against Cactus Jack and Max Payne or Cactus and Kevin Sullivan. And it was like, wow, never seen anything else like that. Now you see it all the time. So it just. Like, well, no yeah, it's OK to like it when you don't ever see anything else like it. Yeah. Now it's just it's every if every match was the alley fight match, I probably wouldn't have liked the alley fight match as much. Because then if everybody was seven feet, you'd have no giants. That's right. But you know who's a giant in the industry? No. John fucking Cena. John Cena's a giant in the industry, and out he comes, and the roof comes off. Because they've never even seen Cena. They can't see him. In NXT, think about this. He predates NXT. He was in OVW. So he's from the previous generation. They never got a chance to love and squeeze and hug on him and call him George. So he put over the big uh, the big night and milked the fans and everything and put NXT over and gave a big rah-rah speech. And then Braun Breaker's music hit. And this was, a, again, who looks like, who of the, the rookies, this new crop, who looks like Braun Breaker? Nobody. He's a fucking superstar just standing there. Plus the talent. Plus he's not rattled. He's fucking, he's talking to one of the big names in the business and he don't give a shit. He's not intimidated. Maybe he needs to cool it with the fake tan though. Well, he is a little dark. You know, but, I, but he's in Florida. Maybe he's one of those people. He's orange. He maybe he's just out there all the time with you know slathering fucking I can't believe it's not butter on himself. But anyway, uh, the fans start chanting bullshit, and so it bleeps some of his promo along with it. But it, you know, a confrontation with John Cena and Braun Breaker, and then Cena says good luck and offers his hand, and Braun nails him, boom, and goes for a spear, and Cena ducks, goes for the. AA and Breaker slips out to the floor. So we've milked, you know, a little something's going to happen later on in the big title match. What do you think of our boy Braun confronting Mr. Cena? Again, I wish it was a little more natural, but I thought he was good. He sounds just like a Steiner. I mean, yeah. just, just a mix of the two Steiners. He sounds like that. There was one part, I don't remember the exact setup, but it did make me laugh, where he was talking about, I guess maybe him and NXT goes, I'm here every week. I haven't seen you. And Cena goes, you can't. And then <laughs> they yeah. moved on. They didn't even like reference it or anything, but it was such a funny throwaway line. It got me. <laughs> that got me. That was good. Uh, but there's going to be problems later on, you can tell. So that Baron Von Corbin is now in NXT. I can't believe they didn't release him when they released all those other people. But, uh, he did a promo. I didn't listen to it because we don't care. I wanted to get to the nine o'clock hour. And that was L.A. Knight and his entrance with his referee shirt under his vest. That looked ridiculous. Come on. But and, and it's <laughs> supposed to. Because then everybody, oh, look at L.A. Knight, man. He don't give a shit. And then it's the NXT title match with Elia against Dominic Mysterio. Rhea Ripley is in the corner. And I, we, we love Elia because he, 
he has the great facials and he's a great worker. And at, at his size, he's like the Tasmanian devil where you can, it's not just like he's you know, one of the buckaroos popping up from everything. You know, it looks like it's hurting him, but the one thing about his presentation, does the Zsa, Zsa Gabor robe fit his... Shouldn't he be out there in like a fucking, I don't know, a Russian farmer's outfit or something? I don't know. But that robe just tickled me. And it, it enveloped him, all the the fluffiness and the feathers and everything. I'm happy whenever you see a male wrestler in a robe nowadays. You never see well, it anymore. It, that's true. It is. It is refreshing. But I, you know, I like this. Elias throws his style. We've talked about it. It's different, but it's interesting. And Dominic, it was clearly the heel here, obviously. But he uh, knows how to work as a heel, and his work to me is greatly improved. Remember, I said the other day I'd have watched it if I could tell, but he had one of the acrobatic opponents. Well, here. You can tell they still gave it the WWE treatment where they go to the break in two minutes. Uh, but when they, when they came back to the, to the meat of the match, this is where I thought that the crowd decided they're going to take over because they started doing the yeah nonstop when the guys are trying to have the match because LA Knight's the referee. And then later on, when Ilya started making his comeback, the crowd at one point started chanting, you fucked up, and I think at Dominic. But again, they had to bleep him. And uh, with Ring of Honor, when we went on Sinclair, I came out at the start of the night. You may have been there a few and said, hey, we want you to cheer, boo, yell, scream, express yourself however you want, but don't make it to where we can't use this on television. This is important to us. And we can't afford to post everything. So if you want to be on television, don't say fuck. And I don't know why they don't do that here in, in because this is getting to be a thing everywhere now. And they're going to have problems with the networks because they're already trying to bleep it and can't. Anyway, Elia has a lot of fire. And finally, he made his big comeback and boom, boom, boom. And he hit his power bomb and his forearm, and then suddenly here came Finn and Funko, two other members of the Judgment Day, and L.A. Knight dumped them. But then here was Trick. You remember Trick? He was Carmelo's friend last time we watched. He was bout it, bout it. I think he, he was bout it, bout it. Well, he finally got here, and then he was with it, with it, and he grabbed Rhea off the apron. And Elia hit a big elbow, one, two, three, and got a big pop beating Dominic. And again, you know, that was a good deal, and L.A. Knight served his purpose. And then, you know, L.A. powders, and Dominic is gone, and Corbin comes out to confront Elia, but Dominic Dijakovic comes from behind and levels Elia before Corbin can get to him and tells Corbin he's mine. So we kind of branched off back into NXT business there. It was a good match. You know, I think, unfortunately, this is where some of the, not inadequacies, but some of Dominic's, what's the lack of polish in the ring come out <laughs> in moments like this? You know, maybe it wasn't the perfect opponent for him, but... You know, I think it was good, and I think also it's good Dominic being here because he kind of has been brought up on the main roster. I think being in NXT can only help him. Uh, you know, not being in NXT like full-time, but going right. down there and working as one of the main guys on the show is something that really helps him. Rhea obviously helps him a lot. Rhea had a very interesting look this night with her hair. <laughs> good match. And, you know, again, LA Knight is being presented now as if not the top baby face in the company up there on an equal tier with a Cody Rhodes or a Jay Uso. Well, and speaking of the top tier of folks, they didn't, they weren't finished with Cena yet. He had to get Carmelo Hayes over and they're in the back talking on a, you know, a peer group level. And then trick came in and introduced himself. And apparently there is tension between 
Trick and Carmelo, even though they used to be friends and Trick may still be about it, about it, but there's problems with them. So then Cena and Trick leave to talk. So they're, again, they're putting these guys in with Cena and the, and the stars so that they can rub elbows as peers rather than little flunkies. And speaking of stars instead of little flunkies, Jane Cargill arrives in another almost their outfit and shakes hands with Shawn Michaels and they start talking and walk into the bed. We never see what happens once she walks into the building, but she arrives in style. And while talking to Shawn Michaels, she looked him straight in the eyes and she had a headache ever since. Oh, come on now. <laughs> she just got a little dizzy. It, it, it passed quickly. And then Baron Corbin was telling Cody to make a match with him and Elia for the title for Halloween Havoc, and Cody came up with Corbin has to win a triple threat match next week. Hey, real quick, and I don't know if you're going to cover it. If so, we'll just skip past what I'm going to say. Did you see whatever it is, the, uh, I forget what the name of it is, the university segment they do? Yeah, well, that's coming up in a okay, sec. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. I didn't skip it. I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on it, but I didn't skip it. Because then we had to go to another British guy insulting Dominic in the back. And we love our friends across the pond. But uh, can we pick like four or five instead of 20 guys that all look approximately the same size with the same kind of haircut and sound the same and fucking do the same things? Because over on the other channel, it's the the Hispanic group. And, and here it's the, the folks from the United Kingdom. Uh, but then Lola Vice with Electra Lopez in her corner wrestled Danny Palmer. And whatever Lola wants, Lola gets, so Lola won. And it didn't look anything like my Aunt Lola, so I'm thinking about suing for copyright infringement. And then was the Chase universe. They're still doing this. And one of the Bravado brothers is Andre Chase, and they wear the sweaters. And this is this is horrible, fake, silly, and childish on an AEW level, and still isn't as bad as the Adam Cole, Roderick Strong stuff. But why are they? I don't know what what could be the audience for this. What what is the eight to twelve year old demographic on NXT? Is there a big pool of those that they got to talk to with these things? That's insulting. I have kids. I don't think my kids would like something as banal. Uh, I thought it. I thought it was banal. It depends. Some people say banal. Some people say banal. Well, but if you take the B off, there's only one way to say it. Well, I'll go back with insipid. I don't know if they said it because it was purposely wrong, but they said there was that Dusty Rhodes was the inventor of Halloween Havoc. Oh yeah, I heard that too. And I and obviously the first Halloween Havoc took place nine months after he had left WCW. Right. So, but don't let that stand in the way of a good story. All right, I've I've got a I'm gonna go out of chronological order here because I want to put all the Braun Breaker in the same place, but I want to talk about the Brian Pillman Jr. package. Because a lot of people were talking about it on Twitter. They they have taken him and twisted this from what the expectations were of a second-generation wrestler, the Brian Pillman Jr., smiling, baby face, and turned it completely around. I like it because it's not only is it a nice little twist on what you would expect, but it's true. He was so young when when... Brian died that he he didn't know his father. He didn't grow up being influenced by his father. He was raised by a stepfather. But they're doing the psychological thing where he doesn't want to be compared to his father. He's not that guy. He's his own man and he looks single white femaleish like his fucking dad, right? That's the point. That it it's it's going to be the the psychological trauma being pulled in both directions. He can't get out of the shadow of his father and escape him, even though he wants to, but he's doing everything he can to look like him, but he changes his name to his real father figure's name, King. 
I don't know about Alexa sounds it sounds like one of the girls though, doesn't it? Someone told me it was after his sister. I don't know if that's true. Her name was Alexis. Well, yes. Yeah. But Lexus King sounds like one of the fucking girls. I, I, it's not that's that's my know, biggest problem with the whole thing. Even if you want to go down this road of him denouncing his father, if he's going to change his name, it has to be a good name. Yeah. L- Lexus King to me doesn't. I don't do mind it. the King. Not sure about the Lexus. Why, why not just Brian King, if that's the case? That could have been a thing. Maybe it'll be my thing. Well, you keep your thing to yourself. because. But anyway, I like the package, and I, I'm... Again, you know, they could have portrayed Brian as a wonderful, sympathetic baby face in AEW back a while back. And in that, you know, kind of with the dark side episode and et cetera, and then that opportunity passed and he was just floating. So now somebody's doing something with him and in record time, by the way, to see whether he's going to get over or not because he's not had a, a chance to this point to really do anything in any major place that would catch on. So he's got that. Yeah. And AEW, who's just another guy running around on that show. It just so happens that his name was catchy. Cause you remember his dad, but he was never really used in an effective way. And they certainly never capitalized on anything when they could quickly. WWE has done more, even though I'm not a fan of this name change. And mostly he was a baby face. So bringing him in as a heel Maybe you'll tap into something we haven't seen yet with him. And and at the same time, again, you've got to to have a chance. He he was tag team partners with Griff Garrison. Poor fella. Looks like a fucking six foot tall Q tip. And the varsity blondes. What because they looked like they were college age and Brian's father was a fucking college athlete. I mean, it was just it was gaga. This is something you might be able to hook into. But but, but if I could just say one last thing, but again, what message are you sending to anyone in AEW who you're interested in when their contract's up? Between Jade Cargill, Cody Rhodes, now even Pillman Jr. Every single person, I mean, I'm trying to think of who would have been the opposite, who has come back from AEW, uh, the OC. But that's a different kind of thing altogether. But everyone who's come from AEW, they've been treated much better here than AEW ever treated them. Well, it's kind of, they're probably seeing it now as, okay, we can be here in high school, and at least we've got a job, but the what we need to aspire to is go to college and learn how to do this shit for real. And that's what they're doing. Or, in the case of Cody, who already knew, it's go to a place where I can actually do this shit for real. Yeah, because Cody, if Cody had stayed with AEW, if him and Tony had been able to heal the issues and Cody had stayed there, he'd be miserable today. Well, either that or he'd be on, you know, the opposite side of a campaign by the Buckaroos because he was getting too big for his britches. And they'd have to punk him out of the company, so to speak. So to speak. So to speak. But anyway, so let's let's go to the main event because uh, I went out of order a little bit. The Pillman package came after an interview in the back with Paul Heyman and Braun Breaker. And Paul does his thing. He mentioned Braun's father and uncle, but not by name. And he says that Braun's got the best of both and he can see the future, but he's the wise man not because he recognized the past, but because he can see the future. And Braun Breaker's the main event of WrestleMania. And then he gives him the big pep talk. The only thing in your way is Carmelo Hayes. And Braun says, I'm going to go through him or Cena or anybody. And he walks out and Paul gets the big smile and calls Roman Reigns on his phone. Or anybody. Or calls anybody. No, I'm saying it could be Roman Reigns eventually. Now what? He said he'll go through anybody. Anybody would mean Paul. Uh, any, oh, okay. Anybody I would see. need Roman Reigns. Yes, but that, but we're we're early for that. Yes. Yes. That's why you jumped in early. Yes. So then, when they got to the match, actually, Cena and Hayes entered, like entered the arena, and apparently were there for ten minutes because that's where they went to the Pillman package, and then they had a bunch more girls talking in the back. But they finally came back to the ring, and Paul came out. 
and gave a big introduction to Braun Breaker, and he gets the big entrance. And again, everything that Heyman said was true, and they know it. He is a WrestleMania main eventer in probably three years. He is a future superstar, and they're, that's why they're doing what they're doing now, because they're planning for the future. Instead of just saying, oh, well, yeah, one of these days we'll, we'll have a real good idea for him and we'll push him. So it's Braun Breaker with Heyman against Carmelo Hayes with Cena. And they've got an, an overrun, too, here of eight minutes on NXT. So the match was speed versus strength in a way. But Braun Breaker, did you see when he got revved up running the ropes? He ran the ropes with more speed than anyone I could think of in recent memory. Yes. And and I'm telling you, he's got that. It, it, Scott's body was better. Rick Steiner was more explosive in his movement. Braun's got both of them. He's got everything. And of course, they went to break in under two minutes. But when they came back, you got at least of enough of a look at what Braun's doing these days. He got heat on the guy's back. He's aggressive. He's, he's both smooth and manhandles people at the same time. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, Carmelo Hayes is great. I agree. He was very good. And he's very athletic. He does nice stuff. Braun Breaker is the superstar. Clearly. And then finally, um, he taunt, Braun taunted Cena a little bit, trying to do the you can't see me and ended up going too far as a heel and eating a super kick. And at one point, Braun gave Carmelo something off the top rope. I don't know what it meant to be or what he meant to do, but it, it, it looked devastating. And then they did the deal with uh, Braun hitting his press and power slam for a two count and then going out to get the stairs. And that's where Cena comes around and snatches the, them away from him and kicks Braun Breaker in the balls where the referee didn't see it. And Solo immediately hops on to Cena, comes out and hops on him, and they fight off. So then Carmelo hit a move on the floor and then a leg drop off the top rope onto Braun Breaker, but while Braun Breaker was still standing up. And they need to work on that one a little bit because it mostly missed him. And th that was it, one, two, three. So they had to put Carmelo over. They weren't switching the belt. They gave Cena the, you know, the opportunity of giving Braun the out by having Cena kick him in the balls. I would have loved for the leg drop finish to be anything else that looked good. But it wasn't a bad match. And again, you know, it just it's a matter of how long they're going to wait before they really start elevating Braun, but he's going to be there. No doubt. Wasn't a bad match. And I think Braun's ready to be called up. He's been in NXT now a while. What's it been, two years, a year and a half? I mean, he's been yeah. there a while as a top guy there. I, think I would have to think he's ready. Ilya has to be close to ready if they're ever going to do it with him. They seem... They like Carmelo Hayes a lot. So we'll see what happens. I mean, how much of this show was an introduction of these people to a bigger WWE crowd? I mean, eventually these people have to move up. Otherwise, I mean, if NXT is not going to have people move up, that means NXT is a third <laughs> brand and it's just going to continue on like that. It doesn't make sense. It well, I, th I think, and I think Braun's going to be sooner than later from the looks of it. But uh, But that was the match. And then... After Carmelo won, Braun hit a spear and started cutting a promo. And then we got Gong. And the, the Undertaker was never advertised, but he was teased, correct? They never said he's going to be there, but they did the teases that would lead you to believe that. At the end of the trailer or the commercial for the, uh, yes, the NXT trailer. show, they had the Gong. So you didn't see him, yeah. but you heard the sound. Well, we didn't actually get The Undertaker. We got the American badass riding the motorcycle with the music from Kid Insurrection. So, thankfully, they didn't advertise The Undertaker. It just, it's kind of a letdown for me because it's not The Undertaker. But nevertheless, 
they got uh, they got Braun Breaker and the Undertaker in the goddamn ring. Same place, same time for Braun to bow up and call him an old timer and say there's only one badass here. Ed in Undertaker says, well, you are going to be the guy one day, but it ain't going to be today. And then he nailed him and choke slammed him. And then he gave Braun the advice. There's always an older, bigger badass. And you just met him. And imagine that all of that made the eight minute overrun. It's amazing how that happens. But the, again, a lot of people are going to say, well, why did he choke slam? It's still, it's Braun Breaker and The Undertaker. For Braun Breaker to be interacting with The Undertaker, to have that clip, it moves him up even if he got choke slammed. And, you know, they, they started with Cena. They ended with Undertaker. They had Paul Heyman, or I'm sorry, started with Cody. Cena was in the middle. Finished with Undertaker, had Heyman involved in that. Solo was there, Rhea, Dominic. You know, you got star power and the three things that happened over the course of the night that they really want you to remember easily stood out because, as normal, nothing much else happens. And there you go. Actually, before we get to anything else, I do want to ask you, you want star power. You want stars to interact with future stars. Hopefully it's in a way that they get elevated, not beat down, because we've seen that too many times in the past. Right. I like the idea of Braun Breaker interacting with The Undertaker, but what purpose does it really serve for him to take a bump for someone he's never going to have a match with? Because it was just, again... It was a chance for, I know it, it violates the rules of old time pro wrestling, you know, get heat on, you know, the heel or the young guy or whatever, but the undertaker's an icon. He doesn't fucking deal with, he doesn't interact with the company mascot. He's not out there fucking doing a deal with Otis or whatever. You're taken as a big star when you're interacting with these guys. That's what the majority of the WWE audience feels. So Braun Breaker will have his time where he will get to lay out, at whatever point that is, the closest thing they've got to a legend that can be laid out. And, you know, it'll go on from there. But in the meantime, they're just rubbing these people up against stars. And obviously, as we can tell by the ratings, and we'll talk about in a minute, that worked. They won. They not only won, they fucking hammered the other guys with names and a big time presentation, if not a lot of, you know, stake to the sizzle. But imagine if the show had ended with instead of The Undertaker coming out there as The Undertaker or as the American badass, what if he had come out there with some really comfortable, fine looking clothes? Well, you know, that's the thing, because the American badass, he doesn't look comfortable. He doesn't look comfortable in his clothing. Whereas The Undertaker looked like, well, that was something he was so comfortable in, he could be buried in it. But I'll tell you what, folks, whether you want to pick out an outfit to just wear around the house, something to wear out in public, or something to be laid out and have words spoken over you in, I'm telling you, I've found the clothing that is the most comfortable of all time, especially the T-shirts, but all of their stylish closet staples. The folks at Marine Layer, our friends out there in Northern California, the amazing company that is now the go-to brand for great fitting and stylish clothes, the perfect mix of laid-back style that looks and feels premium. I got one of the fleece long sleeve T-shirts slash, I hate to call it a sweatshirt, because you don't really sweat in it. It's so soft. It's fleecy. And it's wonderful for fall weather. It keeps the chill off. And at the same time, it doesn't make you feel like a baked potato wrapped in plastic put in a microwave oven. But the t-shirts. Brian, you got one. I know I got one. I got one for Stace, as a matter of fact, that was reminiscent of her Northern California home. And these things are, it's like you washed them a million times, but they still look brand new. It's that sweet spot. You know, Brian, it was an old Native American trick. The old women in the tribe, they would take the 
the t-shirts of all the Native American warriors and they would take them down to the stream and they'd hit them with rocks and they'd rub them with pine cones and they'd wash them a million pine times cones. until they were soft. Why would they use pine cones? Wouldn't that make it the opposite? Wouldn't it put sticky substances on it? No, a pine cone is all rough. That's why you don't use them out in the woods for when you've got to use the bathroom. But they're sticky if you pick them up and try to grab one and like throw it like, you know, at your friends. Well, then that, you get uh, sap you, on your hand. What are you throwing pine cones at your friends? What, you want to say hello to your neighbor, but you don't feel like walking up the street. You throw a pine cone at him. Just beat him in the head with a pine cone. Well, that's why they put them in the stream afterwards and then beat them with rocks. Well, anyway, Not we're, the old women, the t-shirts. We're talking about these wonderful shirts, and you were right. I did get some clothing. I got three amazing shirts. They're so comfortable. One of them has these really stylish racing stripes up and down the arms. I feel like I'm a member of the 86 Mets. Were the 86 Mets fleet on their feet? Well, they had racing stripes. They were quick. They were just, they were running hurdles or what? Well, they were fleet on their feet, but in the eighties, the, a lot of the uniforms had racing stripes. They got rid of that in the nineties. Uh, well, that's because NASCAR complained, but back to Marine layer. I got this wonderful weekend travel bag with fine quality workmanship and it, it just looks wonderful. It's very stylish. Good. Why don't you go away for the weekend? Well, I'm, I'm about to go away from you, but that could, I could just hang up. Hey, Nevertheless, don't do that. They've got fun stuff. They've got stylish stuff. And they've even got sizes like Marge, which is a size in between medium and large, so you can narrow down that perfect fit. And if you buy any three tees from Marine Layer, you automatically get 20% off. So you can get one for you and another one for you and then another one for you and screw everybody else. But... They've also got overshirts, pants, jackets, all the cozy layers that you want for the cooler season coming up. And right now, all you got to do is go to Marine Layer. That's Marine as in Gomer Powell was in the Marine Layer, L-A-Y-E-R dot com, Marine Layer dot com, and get 15% off with the code JCE15. Now... I believe I've discovered a loophole because if you buy three tees from Marine Layer, you automatically get 20% off. But then if you use the code JCE15 at marinelayer.com, you get 15% off. Jump in here. Some way you're going to get some free shit. You will receive a nice discount of so you've confused me at this point yeah see you're gonna you, if you work it right ladies and gentlemen that's a lot of 15 percent, 20 percent. these percentages add up you could con these people i'm pretty sure that our smart listeners no no i'm pretty sure just jack these people around for all kinds of merchandise i'm pretty sure no one should be conning the fine sponsors especially one making fine shirts like marine lair don't con them in the traditional sense or in the modern sense of just tweeting at them nonstop. don't con them Oh, con is a verb now. Yes. Oh, well, in that case, folks, this is a limited time now that our listeners get an exclusive 15% off discount with the code JCE15 at marinelayer.com. You already get 20% if you buy three tees. These things are comfortable. I'm telling you, it's softer than toilet paper. 15% off with the code JCE15 at marinelayer.com. You'll love wearing this stuff wherever you go with it. It really is nice. I have to say, I've enjoyed wearing this new uh, array of clothing the last few days. Very the, soft. the clothing array. What is the promo code one more time, Jim? JCE15. All right, Jim. Well, let's go from comfortable clothing to maybe uncomfortable ratings. I'm not exactly sure. This past week, Tuesday night, October 10th, the ratings head to head Dynamite versus NXT. Any thoughts before we say the numbers? Yeah, well, I think we ought to lay this out. It's a little different than what we normally do. Let's give the, as we go quarter by quarter, let's give the AEW number and what was on and then the corresponding NXT number and what was on so we can compare them side by side. Okay, let me pull up everything. And for this past week, October 10th, NXT on USA Network was watched by 921,000 viewers on average including an average of 396,000 in the key demo. AEW Dynamite on TBS, also 8 p.m., was watched by 609,000 viewers Ooh. on average, including 346,000 in the key demo. 
just the the fact that they were able to come that close in the key demo while getting trounced in every other category is i guess a small victory but missed it by that much all right, and I'm pulling up the ratings and the head-to-head -head numbers. These were compiled by WrestleNomics, who did a great job with these this week. So if we are going... I gotta see if I can blow this up a little bit. Quarter 1, 8 to 8.15 p.m. On AEW, Christian's promo, and the beginning of Brian Danielson versus Swerve Strickland. On NXT... Cody Rhodes, Ilya, Dominic Mysterio, and Rhea Ripley's live promo. AEW, 731,000 viewers. NXT, 991,000 viewers. Ouch. So, right off the bat, that's a difference of 260,000 people, and it looks like from, from those numbers that Neither show is going to keep that steadily. They've got to lose something somewhere because that's significantly higher than both of their averages. What do you think of NXT opening with Cody against AEW? Well, I, I, they opened with Cody because it was the perfect spot because he was going to be the general manager. I don't think they were counter-programming. You know, let, let's get the, the biggest name we got from AEW to put in that spot. He fit it to begin with. I think that just happens to be Kawinka Dinkle. Quarter 2, 8.15 to 8.30 p.m. On AEW Dynamite, the continuation of Danielson versus Swerve Strickland, and Chris Jericho versus Powerhouse Hobbs. No picture in picture, by the way. Commercial free, both shows for the first half hour. Right. NXT, Asuka versus Roxanne Perez, and Tyler Bate and Ridge Holland versus Gallus. Whew. Wait, that was it? The Tyler oh, no, Tyler Bate, Butch, and Ridge Holland. It seemed like there were 18 people in there. There were only three people on that team. Yeah, and that was the pub rules thing. So this should have been a massive swing to AEW. At least they had a good match going on and some name value while there was bleh on NXT, but go ahead. AEW, 655,000 viewers. Ouch. NXT, 956,000 viewers. Okay, so at that point, 76,000 people gave up on AEW and... 35,000 gave up on NXT. Maybe everybody just had to take a shit at the same time. Well, quarter three, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m. On AEW Dynamite, the final three minutes of Jericho versus Hobbs and the Adam Cole, Roderick Strong Kingdom video, Ooh. as well as the beginning of Orange Cassidy versus Ray Phoenix. On NXT, the continuation of the pub battle, now with picture-in-picture -picture ads. And Becky Lynch, Lyra Valkyrie, is that her name? I don't know. Lyra Valkyrie video for AEW, 673,000 viewers. For NXT, 861,000 viewers. Ouch. So again, NXT drops 85,000 people, and they're down 130,000 from the start, but. Meanwhile, AEW picked up 18,000, but they're still down 98,000 from the start. So there's still about 200,000 in between. Quarter four, 8.45 to 9 p.m. On AEW, the end of Phoenix versus Orange Cassidy, Tony Storm's video, and then the picture-in-picture -picture silent movie, Wardlow versus Matt Seidel, Jericho Garcia and Menard backstage, and the beginning of Jay White versus Adam Page with picture in picture on NXT, an ad break, and John Cena in the ring with Braun Breaker, followed by another ad break. AEW, 589,000 viewers. Oh, ho, ho, ho. NXT, 909,000 viewers. Oh, so Cena gets in the ring, bookended by commercials and picks his show up 48,000 and the other guys lose 73 84,000 it's a mix between Cena being on the other show and the Adam Cole segment followed by Orange Cassidy who the fans watching on TV I think have been more sick of than the fans who attend the shows or Tony Khan himself 
Yeah, and you can't even say that Cena took all the viewers away because he only got half of them. The other half just said, ah. Quarter five, the big nine o'clock hour. On AEW, the continuation of Jay White versus Adam Page with Picture in Picture and the beginning of the post-match with MJF Live promo. On NXT, D'Angelo, Lorenzo, and Cody Rhodes backstage, Baron Corbin's promo, and the start of Ilya Dragunov versus Dominic Mysterio with LA Knight as a referee, and picture in picture. For AEW, 549,000 viewers. Ooh. For NXT, 958,000. Jesus Christ. Now they're 409,000 people apart. And obviously at 9 o'clock, everybody looked at what was on one channel and said, they lost 40,000 from the end of the first hour. And meanwhile, NXT picks up 50. All right, where are we going from here? Quarter five, nine to nine, uh, excuse me, quarter five, no, quarter six. What the hell am I saying? 9.15 to 9.30 p.m. On AEW, the continuation of MJF's confrontation with Jay White and Juice Robinson, followed by another Tony Storm video with picture-in-picture -picture ads. On NXT, the final three minutes of Dragunov versus Dominic Mysterio, Cena, Trick Williams, Carmelo Hayes backstage, an ad break, Jade Cargill arrives, Cody and Corbin backstage, Dominic, Ripley, and Frazier backstage, and Danny Palmer versus Lola Vice. For AEW, 557,000 viewers. For NXT, 914,000. My God, and that plethora of crap, they only lost 44,000, and meanwhile, AEW is flat over there with the faithful they got left. Quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. For AEW, Hikaru Shida versus Soraya with Picture in Picture, and Don Callis and Takeshita backstage promo. For NXT, the continuation of Palmer versus Vice, the Chase U segment, Heyman and Braun Breaker. They chased me off. Heyman and Braun Breaker backstage, Cena and Hayes entering, an ad break, and the Lexus King video. For AEW, 558,000 viewers. For NXT, 887,000. And again, AEW, they've got the people left that are just going to watch no matter what. And NXT dropped a few because the, the star power decreased a bit, but we're about to get to the main event. Quarter eight, and I'm going to do the overrun separately this time because it's a considerable period of time they went, both shows. Right. For AEW, uh, picture in picture and full screen, I guess, finishing the Callus Takeshita promo. MJF and the Acclaim backstage. Christian Cage's live promo. And the beginning of Adam Copeland versus Luchasaurus. On NXT, Asuka and Tiffany Stratton backstage. <laughs> and the start of Carmelo Hayes with John Cena versus Braun Breaker with Paul Heyman with picture in picture ads. For AEW, 559,000 viewers <laughs> for NXT, 866,000. And again, the entire nine o'clock hour, AEW did 549, 557, 558, and 559. That was just, those people were like chained to the television. They're never going to change the channel. And NXT did... 958, 914, 887, and 866. I'm surprised the 866 went down with Cena, Braun, etc. I assume they're going to do something about that in the overrun, and potentially AEW might come out of their fucking slumber as well. What what do we do in quarter nine? Quarter nine, the overrun. For AEW from 10 to 10.14 p.m., Adam Copeland versus Luchasaurus with Picture in Picture. The post-match with Christian and Nick Wayne, as well as Danielson, Castagnoli, Yuta, The Gates of Agony, Swerve Strickland, oh, and good Adam Lord. Page. See, I saw none of this. Because <laughs> they went four minutes over their own overrun. And on NXT from 10 to 10.08 p.m., 
the continuation of Hayes versus Breaker and the post match with The Undertaker. For AEW, 606,000 viewers. For NXT, 960,000 viewers. Wow. Okay. So the Battle of the Overrun was won by NXT by the total of 354,000 people. They more than, they had more than half as many, again, people watching their show as AEW did by the time the thing was over with. And the only quarter in which AEW won the key demo number, 18 to 49 year old males, was quarter three, which was the pub match up against... Jericho versus Hobbs the last three minutes into the Adam Cole video into Orange Cassidy versus Phoenix. That is the only quarter they won the key demo. But look... They got crushed look, everywhere else. The the thing is, for all that NXT stacked up all of the, the big stars, right? Cena and Undertaker and LA Knight and blah, blah, blah. You would... <laughs> AEW normally has been doing 850,000. This time they did 600, basically, 609. NXT has been doing around 800,000 or more. They did 921. The point I'm saying is, is that you would have thought that if NXT was taking away 250,000 people from AEW, they would have even done a bigger number. How does this work out? Because NXT only did 100,000 more, maybe, than what they've been doing as an average, a little bit more in some of the quarters. But AEW lost 250,000 off the top and did the lowest quarters three times in a row that I can, or four times in a row that I can remember a Wednesday night show doing. So they didn't all... Start watching NXT, or is there a bunch more crossover than we thought? Is it the all the AEW fans are not fed up with WWE and hate the evil empire? How did this work? Where did AEW's 250,000 people go unless some of them, many of them, are part of the normal NXT audience to begin with? Yeah, I can't explain it. Obviously, there are people who DVR it, and you had to make a choice if you were going to watch it live, what you were going to watch live, but, you know, really not a good number for AEW. You would hope that it would have been a little better, even though it was Well, and, and that's the thing. If it was just all of the fans of uh, the viewers of Raw and SmackDown coming over to NXT, because, well, then they've got two and a half million of them. Seems like they would have got a bigger bump. But basically, it was just... <laughs> A bunch of AEW fans saying, fuck AEW, I'm going to watch NXT tonight like I usually do, apparently. But yeah, 300, at the uh, on the averages, 312,000 people difference, which is more than half of the total audience of AEW. Well, those, and, go ahead. I was just going to say, and it's not like this was unexpected, except by... Tony in his mind, and maybe that's what led to some wires coming loose. Well, some wires certainly came loose. Those were the ratings for AEW versus NXT on Tuesday night. We'll see if we ever get another head-to-head. Jim, we have received a flood of emails and texts, not texts, but emails and tweets and Facebook messages about the behavior of Tony Khan for the last week. There have been a series, including as we are recording, of tweets that were different. I can say I heard from AEW talent that really did not want him to keep doing it because it's not making him look good. It's not making the company look good. We're not exactly sure what triggered it, if not multiple things. Even the fans on Twitter that are normally supportive are saying, hey... Tony, put put your phone down. Get off Twitter. Lay off The Undertaker. What's the matter with you? This is sad. So you can imagine what his normal detractors are saying. You know, there's so many people who complain about the tribalism in wrestling that, you know, there are people who like this and they hate that. Tony did nothing to help any of that this week by attacking seemingly fans on Twitter <laughs> and trying to create a bigger divide between well, fans Well, let, let me companies. tell you something, Mr. First Name Bunch of Numbers. 
he was arguing with random people on Twitter. Can you see Vince McMahon doing this? Can you have seen Bill Watts doing it? Or whoever the fuck? It's, he's, he's lost his grip with all, we've t- been talking about the pressure and the schedule and the lack of sleep, whether, whether he's naturally stimulated or artificially stimulated, he's a high strung young man. And all of this work and all of this pressure and all this bullshit and all of his, you know, talents running amok. Sooner or later, this was, is this the start? Is this the end? Or is this just the tip of the iceberg? But he needs some, God, he needs some relief. Yeah, and again, we don't know, we don't know what exactly is triggering everything. Is his dad asking questions? You said this video game was going to do something. The video game is a complete bomb. We keep having people send us the screenshots of how many people are actively using it online. There's no audience for the game. I got an email from one of the game stores that said they still have the same copies they got when they stocked it when it came out. Well, let's try to recap this past week as we are in it from Tony Khan. The first thing that people started sending us was Tony was on the Dan Lebetard. Is that how you say his name? Dan Lebetard? Dan Dan Bastard? Dan Lebetard? I've never listened to this guy's show. I know who he is by reading his name, but I don't know how to pronounce it. But Tony was on that show. Apparently, they've had wrestlers on before. They have some wrestling fans there. A lot of people have been sending in this audio because Tony doesn't answer any questions, which begs the question, why do interviews if you're not going to answer anyone's questions? No one just wants you to spam them with promotion. People want answers. So let's hear a little bit of Tony. I have a few different clips that Jace Nakarado has gone through. Tony on the Dan Libertard Show. As you head into this evening, because you're not someone who's ever afraid to uh, tell us what he thinks, uh, did you expect, when you took on the responsibility of this job, did you foresee the unpleasantness of, I'm going to be drowning in death threats one day because (laughs) of the decisions I have made? Is that something that you expected? Not really, but I think it's great. I really, to be honest, I think the, the, yeah, the rancor of sports fans is across all sports. And it's something I've seen in football in the NFL. You see it in football in the Premier League. And for us, it's a great thing that we have. Past- if you're getting death threats from fans of multiple genres of sports and entertainment, maybe you're not a good owner. But if you're a manager, if you're a heel, well, that's that's just swell. But if you're the the actual owner of the company who depends on fan support and you're getting the death threat, that may not be not good. Are you concerned about these death threats? No, we get them all the time from the football fans, from the <laughs> soccer fans. We hear it from everyone. Passionate fans that really care about AEW, that really get excited about the shows. I love it. And our fans are really supportive. We're on our best run of major events we've ever done. You know, recently we set the all-time record, the world record for ticket sales for any wrestling event ever. We've done all kinds of unprecedented things since we started this business. And might I add, the first ever AEW TV contract I ever signed, I actually did it in your old office at the Clevelander after you had me on the show. So we go way back and... Your show has been a great home to me for many, many years. <laughs> Let me stop it there. It's, it's just the way he talks to people is so funny to me. Everything is great. And it's just, and it's overly great. And I will continue to talk about how great everything is, even if it's not a question you asked about. Well, let's go to this next one. Jay says here in the notes that it's a rather long question. Let's see. Talking about if AEW is cold or hot right now. Tony, you mentioned uh, threats from fans, and you also mentioned the the great show at Wembley that I was uh, in attendance for. Uh, I do agree that you've had a, a really great run lately, but there have been those in the media. Dave Meltzer recently said AEW is running cold. I know that uh, attendance is now all of a sudden fodder for memes. You've brought in Adam Copeland from WWE. There is a sense that with Jade going to WWE, there's a lot of positive momentum there. Uh, how can you change perception right now? Let me stop there. What do you think of that question? Good question. A good question. I'm going to be interested to see if the answer comes anywhere near 
talking about the question. Well, I think I, we've really begun to change it. I think the perception is very strong for AEW worldwide. Like I said, we're 44 days ago, we set the all-time record for ticket sales for any wrestling show ever in the history of the planet. So we're having a very good year. Our pay-per-view numbers are through the roof. And we're going to have a great show tonight on TBS. I think the fans are really behind what we're doing. People really are mobilized behind this lineup. And I have to say, I've seen more positive momentum, more positive feedback about AEW in the last 24 hours than I had in several weeks. And that's saying a lot because we've had a lot of huge shows in the last several weeks. There's a Let me stop it there. What is he talking about? More positive <laughs> momentum for AEW in the last 24 hours? This is in the middle of his Twitter storm. And he's also not addressing the fact that the guy asked about the tickets aren't selling, the crowds are down, the show is cooling off. You can't book. I mean, everyone's still being nice about it. Some people are now coming out and saying it. We've been saying it for a long time. Tony can't do this. Tony's not a manager. Tony's not good running a business. Tony can't book. He loves wrestling. He doesn't understand why the rest of us do. A lot of things that uh, have come across your way that maybe you weren't fully prepared for when you went down this venture, the managing of people and personality dynamics. At that show, you guys managed to put on the biggest show in wrestling history at Wembley Stadium, but you were dealing with a nightmare scenario backstage as one of your performers got into a fight with another one of your performers. You've come out and publicly said something happened back there where you feared for your life, and this is all surrounding <laughs> Phil Knight, a.k.a. CM Punk, who's now no Phil longer Knight? with Phil Knight. the company. I know that there's a lot of... Well, the cat's out of the bag. He's coming back to WWE as Phil Knight. Wait a minute. Wait, as a matter of fact, wasn't that uh, yeah. Uncle Phil on Fresh Prince? Was that not specifics that maybe you can't get into? No, get into the specifics. <laughs> I want to talk about the managing that scenario. It flashing before your eyes. Oh, my God, this is happening right now. And having to put on a show as one of your top performers, top build performers, a star that was on all the marquees, has lunged towards you in a threatening manner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't really want to talk about it, but I will say that oh I'm really God. glad that the event came out as one of the best shows I've ever seen in pro wrestling. It was over 81,000 tickets sold, 81,035 tickets exactly. And the crowd was amazing, the show was amazing, and the wrestling was amazing. Everybody who wrestled on the show from start to finish did a great job. The fans were behind it. It was one of the biggest pay-per-views we've ever done. And we set okay. huge uh, milestones, really, that this company is all about. That really, when <laughs> AEW began, it began as a love letter to pro wrestling for the fans. We had never gone to Europe and done a show. It began because your dad said, let me give him money to finally shut him up about all this. That's how it began. And, and the question was, how did you feel and or deal with the stress of having the punk fight? And uh, he pivots like a, like a bad politician, but let's go back to it. So we debuted there with one of the biggest wrestling events in the history of the world. And yes, it was a challenging day backstage. Uh, without getting into the specifics, it was a hard day. But when the show was over, I think we were all really proud. And everybody held their head high that this is one of the best wrestling shows anybody's ever done. And AEW, were the ones that did it. It's a big deal. And now we have this show tonight. Uh, the whole company's really round. The question was, what happened with Phil Knight <laughs> that made you scared for your life? Telling around the people wrestling on tonight's show, I think... Tonight on TBS, you're going to see AEW at our very, very best. And yes, I am glad that you enjoyed the show. I thought it was a great show, but you're right. It was a hard day. It was hard to get to that point. And thankfully, it came out as a great show. I'm going to tag in Dan real quick so he can actually get like the real news-making answer. After Let me pause it for a second <laughs> before they try again to get Tony to answer. Any thoughts on this? I mean, it's just, it's words coming out in, in a cacophony, in an avalanche, in a waterfall. And it, it, it's always about how great they're doing and how great everything is and how great he is. And, and it doesn't have anything to do with any of the questions that are asked, but it's the same answer with words in different order. Makes me think of the Ariel Hawani interview where Ariel got frustrated because Tony wouldn't answer anything. Everything goes back to let me promote my stuff and talk about how great everything yes. is and how happy everyone is. If you're going to do the show, then you have to answer some of the questions. If you don't want to answer any of the questions, except with the same answer, no matter what the question is, don't do the shows.
Yeah, get someone to be the public face of the company and actually do these things and do it right. But let's there go, go. Uh, back to the audio. After I apologize for making <laughs> CM Punk the inventor of Nike. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> that's who Phil Knight is. By Tony. He asked you a question, and you've been at the fight game a long time. A total non-answer at the beginning, and then just unrelenting promotion because you're a dirty <laughs> fight game promoter, and you didn't come You know, there's a lot. There's people doing a lot worse stuff in the fight game than You're right, Tony. You, no, I got to say, like, that's a book. Stuff. It's a bu- look. No, that was bu- it's bull. It, there, something happened. I want to know what happened back there. What happened back what there? What happened? Don't tell. Don't, don't give Did us. Did Bill I, Brooks attack I, you? I can't talk about it. What is that? You're. I came on. You came on, and I'm like, this guy always answers the questions. You honestly. said you feared for your life. You promoted How? this thing a couple of different times. All right, you got your promotion on. It's tonight. You got a rating. I'm glued floor. to Title Two. Give me some of the good Did shit. Did he throw a punch at what you? What happened back ha, there? Ha. I have not really gone out and discussed that publicly beyond what I said in Chicago. I had to make a really hard decision after what happened. And I really appreciate all the fans standing by us and supporting AEW through this. And we're having uh, a huge show tonight. Oh my But I also am not saying anything <laughs> that I haven't said before. Well, that's, Why not? That's Just useless. But we're special. We say it to us. Whisper it to us. Tony, stay strong. Did he need, punch you with guys, the left or right hand? Did he make contact? You haven't said before. <laughs> Did you need an ice pack? Do you not understand how promotion works? Something, we don't want the same things you've said before. We want a little bit extra. Just give us a little okay. something. Who wins okay. tonight? Well, that's a good question. About David right Billy, he was getting yeah. there. <laughs> See, I really appreciate you giving me that out. Uh, Damn it, Billy. He was getting there. He said, okay. Come on. Left or right hand? What did he punch you with? Guys, what happened back there was a really hard day for a lot of people. And I don't want to make light of it because it was a really challenging circumstance. It was one of the most incredible things I've been. He doesn't want to talk about it for the same reason he wants everyone who he deals with to sign NDAs. He doesn't want people hearing about how he is backstage. How he runs the show and his behavior. Here's what happened. Two of the guys had a minor skirmish that involved a fucking front face lock. Nobody was even fucking injured, busted open. Minor fight injuries. Yeah, you fucking busted me open, you son of a bitch. None of that happened, and Tony Khan got yelled at. He got yelled at while people were scuffling with each other. And if he was indeed afraid for his life, that's possible because he's fucking never seen anything like that before because he doesn't hang around with grown men. And the lawyers have told him to say that he was afraid for his life so they could set up a defense if Punk had wanted to fucking sue if he hadn't been so happy to just get the fuck away from those people. That's what happened. Well, let's finish this uh, audio here of Tony Khan's appearance on Dan Levitard through in wrestling it was a really hard day at the office uh for a lot of people and the amazing thing is that we still came through and put a great show out under what were really challenging circumstances and for the fans there including you mike because there's people that traveled from all over the world to come see this show it was really important to every single person everybody back there to get it together and have our best show and we did it you know what i like to do after a hard day at work sometimes i like to talk about it uh, yeah, uh, talk just it air out, it out yeah. relive some of the events right. maybe talk go blow by blow <laughs> and and really have my my friends lift me up yeah, we're just that's what we are yeah. we're, get it we're off your friends. chest come on uh, have you- give us a nugget guys i i really think that uh you know, we got frankly, him in the turnbuckle right now. <laughs> <laughs> the refs, we got a, we got to the count of five. <laughs> refs at four. Yeah, I'll, I'll, get, worse, right, I'll, I'll give you what you want Ton- tonight on TBS. Wrestling promoters, than not uh, talking about these kinds of backstage incidents. Believe me, uh, not talking about this thing would be the least of a wrestling promoter's misdeed. Tonight on TBS. Let me stop it there because that's one of the many shots at Vince McMahon he's taken this week. Not to say Vince McMahon's an innocent little baby that needs to be, you know, that you can't say bad things about, but it's the other promoter constantly making references all week to Vince McMahon, who's never, I don't think, ever made a reference to him. I don't think uh, Vince has ever uttered Tony Khan's name in public, but it's the Pafos and the Jarrett's because the Pafos knew that they were the opposition, the outlaws. They had to talk about number one. Number one doesn't talk about number two. That is a great way of looking at it that I haven't looked at it like before. It's the Pafos and the Jarrett's. Let's finish this. 
CBS. It is titled Tuesday. That was a shot of Vince McMahon. I get it. Mm. It is the is it indeed the most dangerous situation you've ever found yourself in backstage? Yes or no? Uh, without a doubt. Without a doubt. One hundred percent. Yes. <laughs> Did you indeed fear for your life, or was that performative? Yeah, I was scared as hell for a moment there. Oh my God. No, no, no. I really don't. I would love to talk about tonight. Go Jags. Oh. Hey, big win. Oh, All right, let's stop it there. Yeah. How can you be, how could you be scared for your life in a populated area with a man barehanded about to dress to go out to wrestle? It's just fucking front face lock some asshole. How does that make you fear for your well, fucking life? Well, I guess the story is or at least a lot of people were assuming that after that incident, there was a separate incident where CM Punk confronted, lunged, some people have said. Who tore, is he, tore Edward into... Scissorhands? Did he have a fucking hammer in his hand? <laughs> well, no, Did Edward Scissorhands... Did he have a knife? Did Ed... he have a blackjack? Edward Scissorhands had scissors in his hand. He didn't need a gun. Well, saying, whatever the fuck. Or was he just saying, hey, Tony, you're a fucking idiot. You've run a fucking shit show and I quit. Yeah, did he get in your face and yell at you for creating this situation again? Because that's different than I was afraid for my life. Well, that's the audio. What are your uh, final thoughts on Tony's audio appearance in the middle of his crazy week? Well, again, that didn't help him any with his public persona. But still, that's what he always does. He always sounds like that. He became completely unhinged. With the tweet storm that I assume that we're going to be talking about momentarily. Well, Jim, Tony likes to talk about the tickets they sold for Wembley. Perhaps Tony could start a new business. Maybe he could start a new website where he could sell his own tickets for his own fantastic events. In his own mind? In his own mind. Hey, and now take a journey to the center of Tony Khan's mind. But, uh, you know, what he needs, here's what he really needs. What he needs is somebody to sell his product because Tony is awkward, to say the least, verbally. And Tony is not the best salesman. He's not the best pitchman. He's not the best carnival barker. He's not the best platform. He needs somebody to sell things for him because he couldn't sell pussy on a troop train. But I'll guarantee you that our friends, and you know who I'm talking about, ladies and gentlemen, none other than... Need we mention them any more, as Mean Gene would say? Our friends at Shopify can help you sell whatever you're wanting to sell at every stage of your business. Yeah, because Shopify is the global commerce platform that basically does everything. And I'll tell you what, as a matter of fact, I've heard now that you don't have to sell just your own stuff anymore. They got Shopify Collective where you can curate products to sell from the brands that you love, giving your customers more variety and your business more sales. So basically, Shopify can just give you the rights to sell everything. If I were you, the first thing that I would well, do no. is I would sell the movie rights to the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe. Well, no, they don't sell give you, those to somebody. They're not giving you the rights to sell anyone else's intellectual property no, or it content. Says right or, here, you don't have to just sell your own stuff anymore. You can curate products to from other brands. That means take them from other people and sell them as your own, doesn't it? Well, that means if another company, per this example, were to have Marvel <laughs> Avengers DVDs for sale, yes. You could sell those finished products as long as they are officially licensed. You and, couldn't sell the rights to And it. undercut those son of a bitches, too, while you're at it. Sell them cheaper, and they'll put, it'll put them right out of business. Who? Uh, those other people that you want to curate from, i.e. steal. But nevertheless... Are you talking about the studio? Who are you trying to put out of business? Whether you're auctioning autographed apparel or selling sleek skis, Shopify helps you sell everywhere. And uh, they've got that great converting checkout. We've talked about that. But did you know that they... Uh, it, it was right here on the notes. I'm trying to find it. Yes. They make getting paid simple by instantly accepting every type of payment. And we're, we're, we're talking cash, check, money order, s &H green stamps. They will actually what? trade you for used clothing or potentially cold for the furnace in the wintertime. They will not be doing that, certainly no, not. No, if, if somebody says, hey, I got five lumps of coal and I want to buy the sweater on that website, they will work something out. They will not be working with anything other than good old-fashioned 
U.S. dollars. Well, I'll tell you what. Here in the United speaking, States, at least. Speaking of cold, hard cash, they here's another thing. They teach you how to sell, right? So a guy from Shopify is going to come to your door. When you let him in, the first thing he's going to do, he's going to haul off and punch you right in the face. Boom! And if that's you don't sell it not, right, that's not how it works. And he's going to explain to you how to recoil and grab the part that hurts and make a face. No. And, and and your body language and how you sell, but not he doesn't teach you how to sell punches. He did well. For the okay, for he's the record, take, no, no, no one from he's Shopify. He's going to grab you and no, he's going to take you down. No, and he's going to put you in a cross face. No, and he's, he's going to float over into a crotch locked leg strangle. Nope. And he's going to teach you how to sell that. You got to scream and cry in anguish. He'll crank it up a little bit. You'll be screaming and crying with Screaming? joy from these fantastic. <laughs> Stories that Jim has created, but no one's coming to your house from Shopify. No one's going to be punching you in the face, let alone whatever else he was talking about no, here. Oh, they're teaching you to sell products, not moves and holds, right? Right, and in the That's virtual realm, not coming to your door. The, the realm of virtuosity, because they're very Virtuality. virtuous over at Shopify. So that, like I said, they take everything in payment, and, and if you can't pay... They'll get it out of you some way or another, and they will get the people that are <laughs> on their side. You, the Shopify client, they will get you your money <laughs> one, one way from or another. From yourself? From yourself? You just said if you can't no. pay, they'll get the money for you, the I was, client. I was using the royal you. Now, if you, the customer, don't want to pay Shopify for you, the client's product, then you, the customer, are going to get worked over with a sack of rocks. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to start an online store to sell your products and you want some experienced help, a well-to-do platform that you could sell your products from, and the right way to get things going, that's why you should be thinking of Shopify, not whatever's going on over there. Well, and another thing with Shopify magic, you can whip up captivating content that converts. From blog posts to product descriptions, you can generate instant fact answers. Fact answers. Fake FAQ. Because you say it, it sounds fake. You followed that with, but with Shopify magic. <laughs> well, that's what it is. When they got Shopify magic. And they're, that's free for every Shopify seller. You can pick the perfect email send time. What if there is no perfect time for me? I generally shun them all, but nevertheless, nevertheless, Shopify grows with your business, no matter how big for your britches you get. And thanks to an endless list of integrations and third-party apps, well, they're fully integrated. They're not racist here. And they've got third-party appetizers, so every, every third party you go to has appetizers. You can use their applications across various platforms that everyone would have on their smartphone or anything else, like a tablet, anything that you don't personally own or have any knowledge of. Well, anything you can think of is what it says. From on-demand printing, I demand you print this. And it happens. <laughs> 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 Accounting and chatbots, everything you need. Folks, But we need to say no more. Except right now, sign up for a $1 per month trial period. That's practically free at shopify.com slash jce now remember the jce is all in lowercase if you type it in in capitals your computer will be taken over by the russians no go, go to well don't you don't use capitals to find out go to shopify.com slash jce one dollar per month trial period for this fantastic service where it will make you absolutely nothing but That's right. Get registered with Shopify. That sounded nasty. Get registered. Well, you played the cash you know, register. I mean, if you went up to somebody that didn't speak any English and said, hey, you, get registered. <laughs> True, that man. It as, a, as a pretty goddamn obnoxious statement toward them. Perhaps so. But again, if you have a business and you need a good online presence, an online store, check out Shopify. One more time. What's the promo code, Jim? Oh, the promo code is slash JCE in lower cases at Shopify.com. And this is what will happen immediately afterwards. They'll ring your bell and then they'll come and take you away. Ha ha. Ha ha. He ho ho.
to the retirement farm. What happened to Anita Ward? I don't know. You can ring my bell. Ring my bell. First of all, stop playing the goddamn cash register, but why did you think of her from They're Coming to Take Me Away? Because I she, she was ringing the bell there. What what happened to her? She she you could ring her bell in 1979 and by 1982 you never saw her again. The bell cracked. Well that those do quite well up in Philly. All right, well, let's somehow move on from here. Once again, Shopify, whatever the promo code that Jim butchered a few times. <laughs> J-C-E in lowercase. Don't capitalize. It'll, it'll cause trouble. Speaking of causing trouble, apparently Tony would not let well enough alone after he went on his media blitz or fritz, whichever the terminology is. Well, again, we've all been talking about the impending... Tuesday night fight that happened this past week, NXT on their normal night, AEW having to move to a different night. And all of a sudden, then you started hearing about different things happening back and forth, mainly because of Twitter. On October 9th, Tony Khan tweeted out, the first 30 minutes of Title Tuesday, AEW Dynamite will be commercial free on TBS tomorrow night. Remember, AEW Dynamite is in a special time slot Tomorrow, one week only, Tuesday, AEW Dynamite, title Tuesday, <laughs> on TBS, tomorrow night, <laughs> Wait, <laughs> is way, this one tweet? This is one tweet, it keeps going because it says show more, but uh, this is an image of the tweet, not the actual tweet, so I can't see what show more was. Well, but okay, I and good for him to convey the information, but it got a little busy, but that, yeah, that's something a promoter should do just as Tony usually is a little wordy, but nothing, nothing just crazy go mad there. Honest question. If there was Twitter in the fifties or sixties, how would a promoter like Nick Goulas have used Twitter? Would it have been similar? Oh, good Lord. No, seriously. Tonight, no, it, we're going to be here would, tonight, tonight, come out. Tonight. Well, no, that's, that's the thing is that, you know, if you're talking about a Nick Goulas, it, <sighs> It would have been uh, Bob Luce. Can you imagine that? And I mean death, blood, chaos, violent, hate. <laughs> you know, that's, it, it's old carny circus, of, you know, hyperbole and, and carnival barkership. But in, that was 70 years ago, you, you know, or at least 50 years ago, if you're talking about Nick. And it, it now, especially on a national television show. Again, you know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, the regional sports networks were a little primitive also, whether it be football or college sports or whatever, so you didn't necessarily expect to see Howard Cosell doing the goddamn high school Wildcats in your local market. Some of these shows were local. Some of the promoters were best kept local. But in this day and age, on a national television show, one would expect a little more professionalism, especially from a multi-million dollar company where people could write this shit for him, and he could just bless it or push the button for it if he wanted to tweet it himself and make it a little more succinct and a little more professional. Well, responding to Tony was a Twitter user named Ace... He used a picture of Seth Rollins, and it says, We not watching, bucko. <laughs> to which Tony responded to Ace, Okay, we won't see you tomorrow night for Title Tuesday, AEW Dynamite then, with a gif of Roddy Strong, and it says, Who gives a fuck? Oh, I saw that because a bunch of people started tweeting that, that basically, I don't know how many followers... What was his name? Ace. Ace. I don't know how many followers he has, but he probably don't have the millions of dollars that Tony has, and he probably don't have the television presence Tony has, but Tony was responding to people like this individually, individual fans out there, and taking time to meme, go fuck yourself to them. Can you well, see Vince doing that? Well, for the record, he tweeted out, who gives a fuck? And to that point, a user named Agus 
responded to Tony or quote tweeted it. And he wrote, if Vince McMahon said this, there would be many failed AEW fans crying nonstop and furious. Three crying face emojis. Hashtag hypocrites. To which Tony responded, <laughs> if Sir Vince McMahon said, th- oh, because the guy said, sir, if Sir Vince McMahon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just noticed that. Tony responded, if Sir Vince McMahon said this, it would be the least of his alleged misdeeds. Hashtag Title Tuesday on TBS. Oh my. Tuesday, AEW Dynamite tonight. And that would be like Vince tweeting at Bischoff 30 years ago about, well, yeah, yeah, I got drunk and got hauled into that lawsuit in the, in the gold club or whatever the fuck. It's just, it, I mean, who is the wrestling executive that I have had the absolute least respect for in history? Oh, geez, Jim Hurd, George Scott, Vince Boom, Russo. Boom, no, J- Jim, no, yo, you can't call shit stain an executive. He never ran, I'm talking to an executive, somebody running a company. Jim Hurd. Jim Hurd, Jim Hurd wouldn't have acted like this out in public and interacted with individual random fans like that they were, like that they're in fucking high school on Twitter, on the fucking social media or the Instagram or the fucking FaceTime or whatever the fuck kids get a Snapchat. That's a big one. Yeah, well, uh, here, I got a big one for it. Well, don't put, you'll get arrested, sir. But later on, House of Wrestling, that's Nick Houseman's wrestling news site. It's it's H-A-U-S. See, I see what he's doing there. Well, he tweeted out an article. I don't have the article here, but the title of the article is Triple H and Shawn Michaels look to send Tony Khan a message. Exclusive. To which Tony Khan responded with an image from Curb Your Enthusiasm of two doors with the words bald asshole (laughs) spray painted on them. (laughs) I have a message for them. See you tonight at a special Tuesday Night AEW Dynamite. Title Fight Tuesday (laughs) at 8 p.m. 7 p.m. (sighs) Central on TBS. At least the first 30 minutes are commercial free and... A big overrun tonight. And okay, uh, uh, Michaels is thinning out a little bit too, but obviously Triple H would be the bald asshole. He had a crew cut or a little bush up there last time I saw him. But again, what the... He, he's now he's responding to people with wrestling websites writing, I don't even have any reason to believe by that title, that it was a skewed article. They are. They were looking to send a message to Tony Khan. He's just writing what's going on. Well, fuck this fucking bald asshole. It's it's completely in, unhinged at this point that he's responding to these people in this way, and it's like the it's going to turn out like the. A funny home video of the little guy going up and picking a fight with the big guy and the big guy reaching out and knocking him stiff and that's the end of it. Well, it appears next in the Twitter chain here, there were some fans talking about the match reviews from Title Tuesday on Cage Match, a site that ranks the <laughs> rankings of the fans who rank the matches. The rankings of the fans who rank the matches. Well, he was responding. It's very rank, from what I understand, a very rank site. Well, these are the fans that, whatever you want to say about them, they watch a lot of wrestling and they have their opinions out there, but they watch everything. And he's still in that circle. So he responded to a few of them, apparently. And then on Title Tuesday, Dynamite Reviews, amidst scores ones and threes, two totally unique users who are definitely not both the same person used a very common expression, quote, shows how bad he is at being a normal person on the same day reviewing the same show. I I don't even know how this fucking site works, and what are you saying to me that he is saying that they're putting up fake reviews under uh, presumed names, or what is his bone of contention? That there were somehow a couple of negative reviews amongst all the other fans for AEW Dynamite or some of the matches, and those two people used a similar phrase, he's trying to act like a normal person. 
which I've said on the show, to be honest. We would to everybody that's seen him has, has made that comment. It's not new. We're not breaking revolutionary ground here. But the point is, again, he's on cage match and he's on Twitter. He just fired his biggest star, but he got another one to replace him, Edge. And he's about to make his TV debut on a show that's going to get its fucking ass kicked in the goddamn ratings. And he's got time to do this? Well, that was... Well, that tweet, I should say, someone responded to that named Magic Steam, Magic Stream, excuse me, Magic Stream, woo <laughs> And it was an AI image of Shawn Michaels with a healthy head of hair holding up a plaque for Booker of the Year while smoking a cigar. And the person wrote, Seethe. To which Tony responded, actually, I'm pretty sure that last night blew whatever chance he had at winning that award. The... Okay, number one, what... Does he think he had the better show? He got walloped. His show, for the most part, sucked. And the other guys won and elevated all their fucking next generation of talent. How is... How did he not get outbooked on this particular enterprise? Well, the people on cage match thought he had the better matches. So that makes him the better booker. Oh, but what does he have to do with the matches? The wrestlers in the ring are having those. He just writes the name down. Well, then Tony put on on Twitter. You do, do, do some of these young impressionable and i do use the word marks in this instance do some people believe that when the booker books the matches he writes down what they're supposed to do to each other back and forth i don't do they think, think so. that's how it works i don't think anyone thinks that the booker is the one writing down how everything should go then you you can book a match and it can be good or good or bad and you had the same input in it then it's up to the fucking players to run the play but i digress go ahead well then tony tweeted out thank you all who watched AEW dynamite title tuesday last night i thought last night was one of our best shows that we've ever done the fans in kansas city were tremendous the wrestling was great and last night was the best birthday that i've ever had thanks to all of you to which a Twitter user named Andrew <laughs> replied, we were watching NXT, big dog. <laughs> to which Tony replied once again. He, he, he replied back to this guy who he does, never met, doesn't know anything of fucking about just some random fucking guy on Twitter. Well, then Tony responded, then I wasn't talking to you and you don't even follow me, so why reply? And once again, using the image of Roddy Strong. What was it? It cut off down here. Who gives a fuck, I guess? Who gives what? a fuck? Or go fuck yourself or whatever. So now I'm looking at... Uh, but now this is the day after the show. Has he addressed making mainstream news outlets for being anti-Semitic in the middle of a goddamn horrendous war where people have been butchered? No, and I Did think... Did he bring that up when he was fighting about numbers on Twitter? Not one comment. And again, it wasn't something that was just in a wrestling bubble. It was something starting to get attention. And Tony didn't say a word. Not one tweet about it. But then, I see here, people were talking on Twitter about the peak ratings viewership on NXT versus AEW, and Tony just decided to quote tweet someone and take a jab at Vince. One of the people, Dr. Randy Githrod, PhD, tweeted out, The difference is that Vince has the power and influence to take them cheap shots. He's earned the right to make them. Tony Khan is Vince if you order him from Timu. <laughs> you can shop like a billionaire, but you'll get the cheapest tat doing so. To which Tony quote tweeted, Yes, Vince has allegedly used his power and influence to shoot a lot of shots. Uh, so now he's doing cum jokes on Twitter with random fans. It is is there a fiddle slung around his neck? Well, Tony Tony Nero. Well, then we had another Twitter user named Rebel Kelly, 1982, tweet out, 
what appears to be a fake image of Brian Alvarez saying that the ratings were 1.4 million to 650,000. Which we know they were not. So. so this person tagged Tony and said, this is not a war. To which Tony responded, I must have missed it when Brian tweeted that. So he's responding to anybody, <laughs> it seems like. Then, and this one, I must admit, when I saw this one, I thought it was a fake account. I didn't think it was really Tony Khan, and it was. He tweeted out October 12th, 11.46 a.m. This week, two active decades-long rating streaks from two great legends were ended. With all due respect, until this week's head-to-head -head AEW on TBS versus WWE on USA, neither John Cena nor Undertaker had ever been on a WWE show with under a million total viewers and under 400,000 in the demo. <laughs> That's, again, I thought that was a fake account. I thought it was like AI Tony Khan. I didn't think that was a real tweet. And it was. It was. And again, Undertaker wasn't even advertised. And he didn't even put his fucking outfit on or he made into the gloves. Or anything. He just rode his motorcycle out dressed as he came. And it made a personal appearance and did a choke slam. And as a matter of fact, I would hesitate to say that, well, let's go through this uh, quickly in my mind. Is this past week the first time that Edge, a.k.a. Adam Copeland, has ever appeared on a television program for any wrestling company and been seen by fewer people. It works both ways. But, but the, the difference is, the, it's like The Undertaker and John Cena were making appearances on a local fucking hooping belch telethon, and they were there to wave at everybody. Whereas Tony's fucking taken Adam Copeland from the WWE and exposed him to a smaller audience than he's ever wrestled on national television in front of before, if you're going by that logic. Age Adam Copeland is a legitimate member of his full-time roster, and he was on the other night in front of 500,000 people. And tell me when a WWE program with Edge approached that number. While meanwhile, if fucking Cody's the general manager john cena's in the corner undertaker comes out as a teased surprise and they blow him out of the fucking water because people know who these people are and they care about them could but just again to reach that far and to try it, it, like if it was john cena versus the undertaker I guarantee you they'd have had over a million people. Fuck. Well, he wasn't done. As we are recording here on October 13th, as it is. Tony's on Twitter. Now that we finally got finished and the fucking Infinity guy ran that fucking temporary cable from the road to your estate, your baronial mansion. Plus some time travel. Whoa, shit. Oh, no, no, it's... it's They'll never even on. know. They'll never even know where we started, where we ended because of your technical flu fluvians. Well, a few hours ago, as we are recording, here's Tony Khan on Twitter. This weekend marks one year since Mayo Clinic saved my mom's life. During her ordeal, many AEW talent came to me alleging WWE tampering, inducing them to break their contracts. I'll never forget these phone calls at her side in the hospital. It's when business became personal for me. This is nothing new. This is now another tweet. This is nothing new. I mentioned it last year after she came home. It's relevant today because she checked in for surgery one year ago today. As I've mentioned several times since, Mayo Clinic are heroes, and thanks to them, her recovery from a very grim outlook has been a miracle. So those were the uh, two tweets. What? But that's... But, okay, it may be relevant or pertinent, 
or imminent because it was one year ago today, but it also happens to be right after everybody on Twitter, including some of the people that used to support all of Tony's endeavors, have blistered him for acting like a fucking 12-year-old on Twitter arguing with people, trying to salvage a victory somehow, like, well, it's the first time that they ever beat us by this little kind of logic. And so now he's, well, it's personal because of what they did to me while my mom was sick. We're glad his mom got well. We don't want his mother to be sick. But if that's the only thing that ever made it his business personal, maybe that's the problem. The problem is it's, it's never been a business. It's been personal, but not a personal grudge. He wants everybody to personally like him. And when they don't, and when he loses control of shit, and when they wipe their feet on him, or when somebody knocks what he thinks he does well, he melts down because he's not used to that because everybody has humored him because he owned everything. Well, then Tony responded, uh, he quote tweeted his own tweet, and he said, if not that I should be surprised, but the same WWE avatar accounts that spam me every day, no matter what I say or what it's about, now turning their wrath to mom recovering from a near-death experience is why I straight hate these people to the <laughs> bottom of my heart with all my soul. Well, wait a minute. Who are all these? Are these the, are these the WWE or is these the people that are knocking his mother on Twitter? Is anybody knocking his mother on Twitter? Why would you do that? I don't know. I don't know who has said that. Now, again, is he talking about WWE or the fans? Because he was talking about the Avatar accounts. Or, it, or does he say the WWE, the executives there are behind the Avatar accounts? I don't know. But again, if... if <laughs> I mean, w once again, all of the horrible things that are said by all these people, whether real or imagined people on Twitter, if you let that get to you, then you're fucked anyway, because that's what people do on the fucking thing. But a, 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 he should take his business personally, but not to the point where he's fucking bubbling over at Avatar fan accounts. Just try to do a better product and a better show and beat the other guy, right? Instead of arguing with... Some of these people may not be real people, and he's arguing with them. When I'm looking right now through It's some one thing to blister some fake or real account with a goddamn smart-ass remark and then block them and go on just because it entertains other people. But to go back and forth... No, he definitely... I see here there's a few tweets where he... You know, someone would insult his mom, and he, my mom is stronger than you will ever be, and the original tweet is deleted, so you can't even see what it is. The person hopefully was embarrassed. Yeah. But then there's a lot of him responding to people who have had their own recent losses, saying that he's sorry for their loss. Maybe, you know, I hate to play armchair, not even Booker, but just trying to figure things out. Maybe, you know, maybe Tony's going through a rough time right now, personally, because of family medical reasons, and... You know, I don't know. I mean, he's this week. It can't just be the fact that NXT beat them because he had to know that was coming. It can't just be all the realities. Well, maybe it could be the realities that AEW is not growing. The crowds are getting smaller everywhere. The booking, the booking is getting less of a pass than it ever did before from people that gave it a pass traditionally. I can tell you from with some level of certainty from having experienced it, that when you've got all kinds of stress and a lot of shit's pissing you off, that sometimes it's one of the most minor little things that just sends you bubbling right over the top of fucking pissed off hill into violence fucking valley. And then you either... Is since Tony is not a violent person, you either lash out with a baseball bat or you get on Twitter, I guess. But it could be, it's, it can be a little thing on top of a whole mountain of bigger things that just didn't get you all the way over the edge. But he may need rest, confinement, treatment, counseling, chemicals, some of these things. We'll see. I mean... 
You know, you don't want to see a guy have a complete public meltdown like this, but maybe, I don't know who's there to tell no, him. No, it's much more fun when you can watch it in private. Well, I don't know who's there to tell him, but someone needs to tell him, get off Twitter. It's not helping you. It's not helping the company. It's embarrassing the talent. With all he does, how does he have time to read this shit? What, how does he even have the time? Because this to- is what he lives. He lives for the reaction of social media and message boards because that's where he comes from. His social skills are developed around that. <sighs> so because of that, and because he still sees himself as the teenager on the message boards, that opinion means a lot to him. Whether it does to you or, or me or anyone else, it does to him. So when he sees an online reaction and the way it's been lately, with WWE's popularity in general and AEW's overall problems beyond the punk backstage issues, the on-air problems. With all of that, you've seen a large group of fans suddenly start going with the wave away from AEW because it's not the cool thing anymore and it's not the hot thing anymore and it's still his thing. And to him it is, unless he's lying to everyone at all these press conferences. (laughs) I'm not saying that it's not human nature and natural to like when people say good things about what you do or what or you or yourself or what you look like, whatever the case, compliments. But if you are not only searching those out, but also then your head's on fire about the people who are saying the the opposite, you've got to have some kind of goddamn confidence. And level-headedness, you got to be able to look in the mirror and see, am I doing what I believe is good? Or am I just convincing myself this is good because I did it? And if you can if you can say, I believe what I'm doing is good, and I believe it's getting more positive than negative feedback, and things are growing or moving along or whatever, then you're okay. And if it's, they got to say everything I do is great, or I'm going to have a fucking meltdown, you're in the wrong line of work. Well, one last thing before we wrap this up, and actually we're going to wrap the show up with this, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be back with music and everything next week, but it's been a crazy week and there's a lot going on. Yeah. But I'm trying to see where this originally started. There's a Twitter user named Travis Akers, or Ackers, I'm not exactly sure. He retweeted a TMZ article, AEW criticized for running anti-Semitic storyline amid war in Israel. And he said... We were watching AEW when this happened live last night. It was tasteless and a horrible decision by Tony Khan to pursue an angle woven with anti-Semitism. We changed the channel. AEW lost me as a fan with this one, which sucks because I really enjoyed their product. So he and put- I, yeah, I, there you go. That is, I'm not saying that everybody or even a majority or even half of the fans are going to, but there's some fans that are going to have that reaction and that's something they should have known. I felt similar to that too. So I understand. And I'm not a big AEW, you know, supporter other than like I pay for all their pay-per-view events and I watch them every (laughs) week. Beyond that, I don't support them at all. But Tony Khan jumped into Travis's DMs (laughs) I got the point that you didn't like the angle on the second tweet, Travis. Message was received hours ago. I don't think quote tweeting TMZ is doing much good. So I guess this is a second tweet. I didn't even see the first one. Wait a minute now, but hold on. So Travis tweeted these statements and put up the link to the article and expressed himself, but Tony doesn't even tweet him back. He did the direct message thing to him directly. Yeah, no, he dove into his DMs, as they say. I don't, I don't ever say that. So I'm just trying to figure out how this worked. So he specifically, now it's not even for an audience, it's just to tell this one guy what he thinks. And again, I don't know, I'm trying to see if this guy has a, a fan base, if he is something, and if he is, I'm sorry, I don't know this, but I don't know. But all right, well, he tweeted at this guy, and then he dove into the DMs, I should say, and then... Travis responded, how often do you slide into a fan's DMs to mock a legitimate critique? I I love AEW. In my opinion, you have the greatest roster in the entire industry. I've been to over a dozen AEW shows, have a couple of friends in the company, and have promoted your brand extensively. If I could recommend anything, 
it would be to not just acknowledge our legitimate concern, but address it head on, non kayfabe, on next week's Dynamite. And then Tony responded to him, I know exactly who you are in Jacksonville. That's why I reached out. So that was the whole, what that way? He, not anything about what he said, but I know who you are. That's Howard. And I ba- saw that's ha- what you did. That's Howard Baum's old story. He, 30, he thought he had heat with Kevin Sullivan and he went up to him and introduced himself and Kevin said, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so Tony didn't bother to respond to what he had said. Just, I know who you are. And I saw what you did, and you ain't going to get away with this. Good luck. And what is that? I mean, the fact that he responded that way in a DM and he hasn't said anything publicly, to tie all of this the week of Tony Khan, uh, what did Jace call it over here? Mr. Khan's wild ride. What do you make of that? The fact that he hasn't said a word publicly, but he would go into the DMs and give this guy shit almost for having the nerve to tweet out an article about it. I, I... I don't know why he won't, obviously, I don't know why he won't get off Twitter with these random people. I can see why he wouldn't just want to come right out after the the big thing that he built up, the, the big battle, and come out and say, well, and they whooped the shit out of us. I, at the same point, I think that someone should have even just made a token statement from AEW management about if anyone was offended by, you know, the action, however they wanted to word it. Even if they just, if anyone was offended by something that went on on the program, you can be assured it has been addressed and will not happen again. But no, he just argues like a kid over people that are knocking the losing effort he put on. Should a promoter be concerned? Should a promoter be worried or bothered if talent is upset by their behavior in public? Yes. Um, if I mean, again, a lot of the great promoters did a lot of things in public. But in this particular vein, for, again, the guy who runs a supposed multi-multi-million dollar company who's on national TV who already has looked this awkward in a variety of settings in the past, to be arguing with individual fans on Twitter and knocking The Undertaker for making an unadvertised appearance that didn't draw a million people, it, it, that's when the boys, I'm sure, are going, God almighty, he's not helping us or himself. And why can't he just leave this alone? Well, Jim, as we wrap this up, an important note here. Friday night, November 17th, head-to-head SmackDown versus Collision and Rampage in Los Angeles at the Kia Forum, SmackDown at the Ford Center in Evansville. Evansville, Indiana? Evansville, Indiana. That's the next head-to-head. I didn't even know. The Ford Center is either new or they've renamed the, uh, the place they had, Roberts Stadium. That fucking Henry Ford, he's he's trying to get into everything. So, well, Collision and Rampage will be three hours, so it's three hours of AEW against two hours of SmackDown. Right, because there's no there way they a, could do an overrun because they're going to run into the evening news on Fox. Yes, but I'm thinking there's a line from Billy Jack. They better wait till a couple more hours of AEW shows up to make it even. They're going to get fucking hammered. And again, that's the thing besides the fact that AEW lost more viewers this week from their normal than NXT gained from their normal. Collision was getting hammered by WWE pay-per-views, premium live events, whatever they call them these days, that were on Peacock or you had to pay to see on television. This is the Fox Network. There'll be, you know, six cat burglars and, you know, a fucking drunken bum watching Collision that night with the highest rated wrestling program in the world against it, right? One would think. Hey, one last question on this. If you're in this position, 
you being the general you, not necessarily Tony Khan. Yes. And you know you're up against them again, and it's not NXT this time, it's SmackDown. Do you load up the show, or do you hang back on things because you know you're not winning? Well, you definitely don't want to do anything that is, you know, of, of a debut of a major new star, a shocking angle, if there is such a thing anymore. You don't want to do it on a show that you know is going to have severely low viewership. Maybe you try to put together the show that will appeal most to people who just want to see good wrestling, since that's the base AEW audience, and try to give them that, but not a shit show, actual just good wrestling, and then do a couple of minor things to advance the issues you already have ongoing that you can VTR back the following Wednesday night when you got your regular crowd back. But no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't change the face of the game or the game of the face or whatever else they change on that show that's not going to do 300,000 people. And I guess one last thing, an important note to Tony, even the most successful bookers and promoters ever, well, maybe not the promoters so much, but the bookers need time off, need a break, need to refresh their, what was Ernie Ladd's? expression refresh the brain or re-ring the brain your brain is like a sponge and when it has absorbed all the knowledge that it can you must take the time to wring it out again it's his company it's hard to just do that especially when there's really just bad infrastructure and you know the executive well and, and and we know that there's not a lot of people raising their hand going hey tony you might not want to do that on tv so who's going to do it in his absence and then who are the fucking whippersnapper is going to listen to well we will find out on the experience because that's it for today we'll be back with more stuff next week but we've been going a long time over multiple days you don't even know how many times we've traveled through time in the last few days but once again hear us on wait a minute let me play my time travel music what here we are oh god that's some real time travel music. Hold on. Sounds like sounds like when Heat Wave was tuning up for the opening notes of Groove Line. Well, it may be cold outside, but a heat wave continues on the Jim Cornette experience in a few days, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. All the other usual plugs, wherever you find the plugs in the description or on other shows, but we're out of here. For Jim Cornette. And the paper, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!